a wimble way, a wimble way, a wimble way, a wimble way. On the ocean, the mighty ocean, the tribal sleeps tonight. On the ocean, the mighty ocean, the tribal sleeps tonight. Ooh, wimble, wimble Hello everyone, how are we doing? Hope you're well, and hope you didn't mind that one. That little introduction, but I felt like it. I thought it was a bit fun. Today, of course, is Sunday. If I'm not mistaken, it is the 30th of January. It'll be the 31st tomorrow, which is always a strange day in my opinion. And, mm, well, I hope you're all having fun. There's zero. Now, let's see. What have we got? What are we up to? <sighs> I've got about four books for today, I have to admit. I was planning on having more, but I was planning on having some new books to talk about, and they haven't arrived. Which is annoying. But, you know. Survival. Hello, Nautical Wolf. Hello, Rick Masava. Hello, Carmen Gasberg. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, DG40. Hello, Dan Freeman. Uh, well, I'm planning on mine going on to about normal time. That's what I normally do. And now well, I'll do it until I finish the questions and everything runs out. And then at that point, I will probably go and watch Drax, which I'm sure will go on later. Hello, Frank Spider. Dr. C, if modern protection and armor tech was used in World War 1, World War 2, how much effective do you think they would have been against rifle bullets to AP shells in computers? Um, modern protection and armoring tech was used against rifle bullets. That would certainly be more effective. Against battleship shells? Honestly, I'm not sure if the steel we have today is designed for the level of battleship shell you're dealing with, because... If you're considering most modern armor, we're talking about dealing with the effects of Sabo rounds, which, honestly, there is not much armor which can actually resist the Sabo round, but um, or even has a chance. Some of the British armors and American armors, possibly. I don't. I think the Russians have pretty much given up with that idea um, and are going for reactive armor to try and take out missiles, focusing on that threat rather than the uh, threat of uh, actual rifled guns. Oh, or, as I say, unrifled these days. It would certainly make things more lethal, but I'm not sure if necessarily modern armor would be better for the job than the armor they had at the time. So armor might not change that much on battleships, etc., but it would probably change on a few other things. In terms of personnel, that could certainly be a big impact. Hello, Bijan. And you've been a supporter for eight months. Thank you for being a supporter. If, let's see, I don't know, we could watch uh, Dr. Clark watching Drax stream. That would be a bit too meta for me. Yeah, he, I'm singing again. <laughs> Not team like I'm on headphones. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dan I was just, Jamak, I was listening to Arts About Naval Treaties and then singing. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Richards. Hello, Night 6831. Hello, Peter Underhill. Hello, Jonathan Barrett. Greetings, all. Round of questions. Your thoughts on 16 inch Admiral class? Well, if they'd had eight 16 inch guns. Honestly. It wouldn't have affected things that much, changing from 15 to 16 inch. It's a change. It's bigger. It's more. It's going to affect things. It is going to affect some things, but on the scale of things, it's not a massive change. It's not like going from 12 inch to 15 inch, which I was hearing someone talk about the other day. 
it's you know it's not as big a change so it could have been good it would have probably had an impact on the treaty system because i sometimes wonder if the reason why the americans decided that not only did they not uh, were they not going to try and push for hood because they knew that the British were, didn't want to, but they weren't going to bother so much about Hood, was because Hood had 15-inch guns. And so while she was the biggest capital ship in the world at the time, she didn't have the biggest guns. So there was sort of, she was biggest with an asterisk, rather than biggest, biggest. Whereas if she'd had 16-inch guns and been 45,000 tons, uh, I think there would have been slightly more of an issue. I think the British would have still kept her. I think the Americans might have demanded, though, they completed the USS Lexington as a battle sh as a battle cruiser, which would have pushed probably it to making the Saratoga class battle cruisers, a Saratoga class aircraft carriers. I mean, um, but there again, that could have led to an interesting thing with the Royal Navy going. Well, we don't have to have equivalents converted. And courageous and glorious aren't going to be, wouldn't be equivalent to um, them being converted. So, in the case of we're going to have Hood and the next two admirals that are available, probably the Camelaird's one and maybe the Vickers one, um, will be done. Or maybe the John Brown one. Mm, yeah. Uh, sorry. I'm doing the thing I do when I uh, I think deeply. Uh, but, yeah, it would be interesting what would happen. It would be an interesting thing. Um, nice to go Why do people tend to fail to consider how long it takes to dispose of nuclear vessels? Mostly because politicians only think about problems which are going to occur in their time in office. And as politicians tend to be the ones you hear most in the, having the public conversation, uh, they tend to define the public conversation. Which is why I like YouTube channels and podcasts and the things that I get that me, Drak and Jamie do, because it's about broadening the conversation and getting more people involved and changing the conversation to, to something with more nuance and more context and more content. Which hopefully will produce something better. Hello, 35 Ben Vids. This is Voxo. Do you think a modern aid anti aircraft and CRS weapons could shoot down a battleship shell? <laughs> um, okay, it's the thing is, it's the rate of shells coming in. You're going to run out of 20 millimeter CIOS and C scepters or, an, or anything fast enough to catch a, uh, catch a 16 inch shell coming in at its sort of angle and range before they run out of shells. And remember, they're going to be firing at least nine, maybe more at a time at you. Avian Tavares, hello. P9 Hill. Apart from the Spanish Navy, did anyone else stamp their cannons with phrases like Ultima Ratio Regnum? <laughs> uh, pretty much every Navy stamped their cannons with something. And there was certainly a lot more personalization when the cannons were made of bronze rather than once they got iron. Iron, they sort of started standardizing design and their imaging and casting, whereas bronze cannon tend to be more individual. And sometimes were even individually cast. Hello, Zussie. Got your third jab yesterday. Still feeling like a lot of glory. You will. But... 
Uh, I would say the thing is, as I always say to people, it's your own choice. Uh, but um, thank you for having it because that helps my mum and sister. Is one of my view. <laughs> uh, okay. Atom, Atom, Il Nashirba. Hello. You should use something the sacred cow shipyards. Hmm. Tempting. Matthias Slavic. Hello. Anna Jabal. Hello. There's a foxo. What's your opinion on old history? Do you think it feels feeds into romanticism of certain call of a certain cause? I think this is one of the things. I do old history on occasion. I do uh, do old history. And usually I do it to try and explain the decisions that were made. So my theory is that if we can go back and look at, well, what's the cause offense of why do they make the decisions they do? And what would happen if they made slightly different decisions? And what are the factors which feed into those that decision-making process? I think it can be very useful. But I think there is some alt history out there which is claims to be alt history, which is just fiction. And there is a difference between do, writing alt history and talking about alternate history and fiction. Because in fiction, you change a lot of things. In alt history, you change one or two things. You basically go, right then, these are the criteria I'm using, but then this is my starting off point, and this is what I'm changing. For example, if I wanted to change the Royal Navy's performance in World War II dramatically, all I'd do is make the 4.5-inch gun work earlier. Because if I can get the 4.5 upper deck mount gun as they design and eventually manage to fit onto the Daring class destroyer work in 1935, 1934, so it can fit on the tribal class, well, if they've got four of those guns on them, that changes things. If every destroyer produced after them has 4.5 inch guns. If the Royal Navy can retrofit quickly, which they could do with destroyers, 4.5 inch guns and standardize that across the fleet. If they've got such a good 4.5 inch as that one, then that's probably what gets fitted onto the C class uh, instead of the 4 inch guns, which makes the C class, instead of them being. AA. Destroy AA cruisers gives them a general purpose aspect, which makes them far more capable for potential service engagements with lighter ships. You change history dramatically with one change, and you can go through the list of impacts and uh, uh, engagements and operations that would have an impact on. And that's just changing one thing. That's not doing a massive, and that's that's not really a massive change because the Royal Navy has the four and a half inch working. And we know the four and a half inch working. We know it's the barrel. We know what capabilities it has working on the carriers, working on capital ships. It's the upper deck mount they have the difficulty with. And that's what's delayed. It would have probably come into service if war hadn't happened in about 1940-41. But that it requires time of peace and etc. to get it to going. Which is why it takes until 1945-46. So. So it, 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 there is a difference between doing old history and doing fiction. And once you start changing a lot of things, you're writing fiction. When you do a when you do two changes at the beginning, and you go right, this is what I'm changing, and then I'm just following it through from that. I'm not changing a whole host of things. I'm just seeing what happens and why decisions are made. And then you realize then there's lots of things which start to make sense. What decisions were made over the Dido's, over the C class, over the D class, over the destroyer fit, over what weapons were fitted to them, over the problems the Royal Navy has have with the four inch and the four point seven inch in terms of sights. Well, that's because they weren't supposed to be using the four point seven inch. They invested all this money in this general purpose four point five inch, and it wasn't ready. And so they end up having to make do with what they have, and then you end up with the problems you do have. And it makes sense. You mean Knights Garon? You mean Manson and Howe? Yes. So we'd have had H. Uh, we'd have had the carriers Anson and Howe, which could be interesting. Very <sighs> simple. see. If you replace UK and Japan geographically in the 1500s, would both nations build up the navy similar to how they actually did in each other's places by World War One? Um, potentially. Because in the nicest way, you then end up with a, the UK being off the coast of Japan 
uh, where Japan is, it would still have the same tectonic issues as Japan does. But if it's the UK in terms of its minerals and all the other stuff it has, then it has far more advantages in terms of flat land than Japan does. Uh, but it would change the weather and everything quite dramatically. Be an interesting. It's a uh, quite a complicated one to work out that one. Hello, Wayne Boring. See, Richards, what was the British capital ship to use a double turret secondary instead of casements? A casemates. Well, the Lord Nelsons had double turret secondaries. Actually, their secondaries were nine inch guns. But I'll leave that to one side. There have been lots of ships which have a double turret secondaries. Um, and casemates. It's, it's more of a transition period. Uh, thank you, Desert Foxo. I thank you for the um, <laughs> super chat. I think I've answered that question. Uh, now, how would you classify the captain and crown a colony class frigates? Patrol frigates or frigates? Ooh. Mm. Well, they're frigates. They're designed in World War Two, and their job is ASW. So I just call them frigates because that's what they're built in wartime for the wartime role. They're quite cool. Let's see if I can find a picture of my favourite one. Where is she? Come on, come to me, pretty. Where are you? Ah, oh, there you are. Mum ba dum ba da da dum. I knew this was on the main page, but this is HMS Stena, which was tends to be used as a uh, hmm, coastal forces control ship. She's rather cute, I always think, but she's a frigate. She's a World War Two frigate, which means she's slow, and you wouldn't want to have an accident in her because she might fall apart. But she's still cute. Thank you, Desert Fox. <laughs> For the first suit, that was your first super chat. Oh, thank you. It's very kind of you. Hello, John Evans. Do you have sources that talk about the Elbin class torpedo boats? Wikipedia is the only place I can find anything. Wow. Um, well, for some reason it just flashed up as... I'm not sure what on. Camera on. Hmm. Okay, something's being... Uh, something's behaving weirdly. We'll leave that to one side and sort that out a bit. Uh, basically, <sighs> mm. Elbing torpedo boats. Hmm. I have a book coming, which is supposed to be good. I have a book up there, which is... Uh, it's not bad, but it's basically... It's German destroyers and other small ships. And um, there are chapters in there are good, and the Elbing Torpedo chapter is quite good. Uh, El Torpedo boat chapter is quite good. The there is also another chapter in there which, frankly, I would gladly take out the book and whack the author around the head with. It's one of those books. It's, it's chapters are Marmite. I either like them or hate them, and I quite like Marmite. Average ball. Hello, random question. The cancellation of the last three R class battleships sees the RN reorder them as renowned, repulse, resistance, and reliant.
How does this serve the RN come in 1930s in World War II? The Royal Navy is very, very happy in World War II. Because probably you've upgraded them. If you've got four of them, you'll have got upgraded at least two of them, if not three. Because they're the most, your most numerous, one of your most numerous classes at that point. And honestly, the Royal, if the Royal Navy's managed to maintain them and Hood, so they've got a five battle cruiser fleet, uh, five battle cruiser squadron, then they are quite lucky. They're very lucky. Also, the nicest way, Shan Horse and Nice Man are probably not going to be lucky. Because those ships will be fast enough to catch them. And six 15 inch guns, they could do some damage. Uh. What well, does it change things in World War II? Well, the slower R class battleships are going to be even more behind. But also, the Royal Navy might have changed some of their requirements when. Because if you've got five far ships, then you might well have changed your approach to Nelson and Rodney and the Queens, in that you might have bumped them all up to 28 knots. Might have been sure they could all go 28 knots, and then you've got seven 28 knot ships, five 30 plus knot ships. And you've got the R's. So the Royal Navy would pro would have a very, very fast battle line. Um, with its cornerstone, be its cornerstone being those seven big battleships which could go fast. So and I, I, honestly, the R's probably wouldn't have had any upgrades at all. All the money would have been concentrated on the Queens and the, and the renowned class. Because that would have just given the Royal Navy a far more capable force. Might have also changed their approach to aircraft carriers. They might have wanted them faster as well. Uh, Frank Spider, what kept the four point five inch working from uh, uh, working uh, from working earlier? Uh, the upper deck mounts they had problems with balancing its mechanism. It's one of those fiddly things that requires a lot of time on the testing range and a lot of work to figure out. Which is not something you have a lot of time for in wartime. It reached that point in development, and that's the thing. One of the one of the things you don't really think think about in wartime is you go, ah, oh, well, yeah, testing range. Uh, that's not something that's going to hold up. Well, it's going to hold a lot of things up because you want to prove barrels, and you need to prove barrels for the ships in the service. So setting up rigs to test new guns is time consuming. Hmm. And yeah, you don't get it done. There's a fox zone. In early iron ships, you could dismount cannon and use them in ground combat. When did this stop for major vessels? Uh, they were still doing it right up to the Boxer Rebellion. And I think they used some of the guns taken off from ships in Model 1, so... I don't think they did much of it in World War Two. although I think that some of the German ships lost their guns to ground batteries. Um, I think maybe we'll, we'll go for World War One. It stops. That's Arthur Thompson. Hello, Nook. Steam Richards. Listening direct Saturday. The Aaron could have uh, doubles the secondaries in, in 1911. Mm. The RN didn't really push too much on the 5.1 inch. The 5.25 inch gun was for cruisers. The 5.1 inch gun wasn't really push something for the destroyers because the RN didn't like the gun, uh, the heavy gun. They liked the 4.5. Uh, they liked the 4.7. They liked the higher rate of fire you got by just dropping a few millimeters. It's amazing. Once you start looking into it, the far difference between the 5 inch gun and the 4.7 inch gun, you start looking at the rate of fire. And the, what the British could achieve, especially from their double mounts, and then the 4.5, you start to realize, and the crew and the ship stability requirements, you start to realize what the British were thinking. The British were basically thinking rate of fire. They were back in age of sail, quite simply going, hang on, 
When destroyers are engaging, they're usually within visual range. Okay. Is it going to be a central battery directing program and firing from that? Or is it going to be under fortified, pretty much under local control? Probably mostly under local control. Okay. Make it fast and make it easy. Freeman's book of destroyer design makes you realize just how much a difference a good dual purpose um, guns make to small warship design. They are. They really do. They make a massive, uh, massive difference. Ooh, one. Um, first one, Doug C, the RN give, is given six Atlantas during the 50 destroyer deal. What the RN do with those? Med training. They're going to be part of the med training force, and honestly, they uh, combined with a uh, combined Atlanta, a mixed Atlanta Dido force in the med training is just going to cause panic for various reasons. It would really give the RN some options, especially, especially it depends on when they actually, they might be given the part of that deal when they arrive with the Royal Navy. If they arrive early enough, then they can make a big difference in some ex in some of the convoys, because that's a lot of AA firepower you're giving your fleet, which takes a lot of pressure off other ships. It's going to sound strange. The more ships you have, the more firepower you can put up, the more diffused enemy air attacks become. Uh, P. Daniel, slight old, slight old history, code pur uh, of purple. World War II Japanese diplomatic co uh, code had been deciphered in Washington. Had the Japanese ambassador in Washington been informed in advance of December the 7th? <sighs> mm, not really. Uh, he had basically seen things coming, but he hadn't been informed of what was going to happen. He was specifically kept in the dark. Of what was going to happen. So that doesn't really probably tell anyone other than if they can read between the lines like he could read between the lines. Anak, how did the USN 5 inch 38 mounts compare to the RN 4.5 inch mounts, both before and after they were made to work? Both are fairly good, but you have to remember the USN was thinking around a single... They ended up going with multiple gun mounts and all these things, but they did start off thinking about single gun mounts, which a 5-inch then makes more sense. But the 4.5-inch made sense more in the double and the multiple mounts, and that's what the thing. The British were thinking about a double mount, and the Americans were thinking about a single mount, and the British were thinking about engaging in at night action and closer range, and the Americans were thinking, to an extent, longer range, actually. Both are good general purpose weapons. It's just, there's falls and against in both. It's, um, to quote Scott, uh, to quote Spock, it's half a dozen and one six the other. Uh, no, it's a Could the Type 21 frigates have gone lightweight Seawolf, or does the lack of the placement for modification make that impossible? They could have got lightweight uh, Seawolf. I think some of the Type 21s actually got Seawolf. So certainly some of the Type 12s got Seawolf. Some of the Type 21s got Seawolf, I thought, when they were converted for other navies. But they might not have. But they could have got it. I mean, you could have put lightweight Seawolf on them. It would have been a trade-off. You would have had to get rid of something else, but you could have done it. Pigeon, I'm HMS New Zealand. I understand the reasons for going with 12 inch instead of 13 and a half, as explained in Drax's interview, but why not go with super firing instead of repeating the first generation of. Uh, uh, go super, uh, super firing instead of repeating the first generation battlecruiser design? Oh. Someone had a panic attack? Honestly, it's more down to the fact that they were going with the model they could already cost out most easily, and they could cost that one out very easily. And again, she's sort of a second class. Uh, if you're consider you're building her in a period when you're already building something bigger, you might as well build off a tried and proven design you know is going to work. 
Uh, Strike142, what do you think is better, modern CLOs or Phalanx firing a stream of AEP armor piercing rounds, or a single twin quad 40 mm mount firing, fr uh, firing 3P musicians? One relies on pre precision, the other uh, creating a cloud of death. Uh... To be honest, if you have a quad 40 mm and you have enough space in your hull, to carry enough rounds, you can make a cloud of death with the 40mm as well. So, yeah. Mm, nah, it's uh, interesting. Uh, Shrink, is it because the author said the German destroyers were good? No, it's because the author seems to think that A, the Narvik class is more than just a theoretical thing and actually is a massive redesign, and B, he, the, he thinks that the Narvik class of German destroyers were somehow a leap ahead of their predecessors, and really they aren't. In fact, they're pretty much a repeat. Which anyone who could actually read a diagram would actually be able to tell you. They're dressed up as being an improvement, but you actually read the stat, uh, read the schematics, and read the design overlay, and you realize it's just repeat with new labeling. Hang up. How about the USN destroyers uh, classes? Fletcher's on the gearing and RN travel battle and daring. Hmm, that would be a fun book to write if I could spend the time in the US archives. I'd want to. There is a there are some good books out there. US destroyers by Freeman, etc. Uh, I I'm still quite happy with the fact that the worst review this one's got so far on Amazon, which is a three star review. And thank you very much for everyone who's given me the five star reviews. It's very kind of you, and I. I hope I, I I hope I it's, it's very nice of you, but this one's got oh, Mon Fries. It's basically gone. It's not Norman Freeman, and I went. I was sort of reading and going, but that's actually quite a massive compliment, because the fact you're even putting me in the criteria where I'm being compared to Norman Freeman, who is like one of the gods of naval history, even though I'm not matching up, I don't mind. You're putting you're already putting me in the bracket where I'm comparable to. That's 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 a compliment where I come from. That's a that's a nice thing. Okay, yes, I haven't reached there, but this is my first book and Freeman's on like his 40th. Um that that, that that's fine. I, I, I'll work up, I'll I'll get better. GD Hanna, hello. Uh, when floating in your barrel at Niagara Falls, consider there is a Fletcher at Cleveland about 20 miles away. The museum right and might want a lecture from a wandering, if somewhat damp, historian. <sighs> well, I have a feeling I'm going to end up organising this whole trip and paying for it. Um, and that the money's going to fall through, but... I just had that feeling because people have got other people who are supposed to be, who might be funding, have gone quiet. Uh, in which case, I'll be sorting it all out. And as I said, Rack and I are going to be finalizing details and working things out. So, well, I decided already that if I'm visiting Canada, I'm going to see Hyder and Sackville. That's the thing. And I'm quite happy to go on a road trip and go to see others as well. I'm quite happy. Uh, as you said, you said it's about 20 miles away. A Fletcher and Cleveland are about 20 miles away. Well, the nicest way, then I could just stick in Hamilton with a, de with a decent car. We could And we could go to, uh, to see the Fletcher and Cleveland. Be tempting to. Strike one for two. The reason for my question is that I just don't want to get why Funks is still being dragged around when better solutions already exist. Uh, inertia. And also because quite a lot of people do love Phalanx and because it it just is a stream of metal, which they, they like the idea and it's got a lot of technology and a lot of precision built into it. But how do I put this? 
when someone's turning around to me re uh, recently and going on about going, well, you don't know how confined the spaces are in modern ships. And I, go, and I turn around and going, we are now building the fourth generation of ships, which are going to have phalanx as their closing weapon system. Don't take this the wrong way. But this generation are averaging in roughly 9,000 tons. The first generation they started in averaged in at roughly 5,000 tons. So we have almost doubled the weight of the ship. And you're honestly telling me that we could then at any point think, well, hang on, let's, if we're already doing this, we're add on a bit more weight and maybe even a bit more length and there's stuff we need to do to make sure we can accommodate a slightly upgraded version of Phalanx. Because you can take the software you could take the idea of phalanx and you could go, right then, what kind of 40 millimeter can we work, make work in a Gatling scenario? And there again, people go turn around and go, oh, you can't do that with a 40 millimeter. And I go, why not? Um, usually it starts off with the pressure, complications. And they're right. There are lots of engineering issues. But we're on the fourth generations of ship, the fourth generation of ships carrying these things. We can compare it to missiles. They've had a huge number of upgrades, not just software, but entirely, you know, upgrades in in the, the missile itself has changed. Every every single missile itself seems to go through multiple generations of software, or software and engine sort of upgrades. But the phalanx has stayed the same. Even the company which makes phalanx has proposed super phalanx and various versions of phalanx with heavier guns. Because it... <sighs> The Elbing's feature in J. Whitley's Destroys World War II. Yeah, but not much. It's about a little page. So that might be where quite a lot of the stuff um, comes from in, that, in Wikipedia, but no. Hi, Paul Verswick. Frank Sonner, Dr. C. or Dan, what were all the secondaries the Iron had in World War II? Um... Four, uh, well, Dan has quite certainly pointed out, Dan has pointed out the 4-inch. 4.5-inch was used as secondary, uh, secondary. 4.7-inch wasn't used as a secondary. And 5.25-inch. 4.7-inch was a primary for destroyers. So there weren't any, and there wasn't, I don't think any ships were fitted with 4.7-inch as the secondary. A few ships had 4-inch, and a few ships had 4. Had 4.5 inch as their secondary armament, although, in a nice way, an aircraft carrier is pretty much their primary armament because that's the largest gun they carry. And some ships have 5.25, but 4.7 inch is the destroyer weapon. And basically, the RN had the secondaries for carrier for carriers and battleships. They were trying to replace them, or they were sort of doing a F 35 approach to guns. They were trying to place the 4 inch, the 4.7 inch. And the secondaries on carriers and uh, carriers and battleships, all with one gun, to uh, streamline and have one ammunition type. Hmm. Let's see. What was the IJN's best destroyer gun? They didn't have a good destroyer gun. They just they didn't. They had the 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 the. the, the hello, Peter Hunter. Welcome to pick up. Thank you for coming. Um, the IJN's destroyer guns were... The IJN had a similar policy to destroyer guns as the Germans, in that they get these powerful guns, which they can't really reload that quickly. 100mm is fairly decent as things go, but that's rather limp-wristed for by World War II standards for a destroyer's primary gun. Mm. Oh, let's see. Major Mass Trump, which I do. I think.
it's a T-class destroyer uh, from the name, which is one of the um. Well, it's the same class of war emergency destroyers, which were built, uh, which were um, which included HMS Savage, the one with the double four point fives forward, uh, fifth and sixth emergency flight out flight center. Post war became a Type Fifteen anti submarine frigate. That's just judging by bit by memory and a bit by looking up her picture. <laughs> so it's a question of how can you uh, just checking it's the it's a T class boat because it's name. That's the first thing I was going T class. It's a T class. It'll be sick flotilla emergency flotilla. Hang on, check its picture just in case. They did cut down some other things, and. Trout, it was Trout Bridge was based on Trout Bridge, so yeah, she's based on, on Trout Bridge. Uh, I know Trout Bridge is the pro, is I think the com is the radio saga, is it or something? Uh, but um, Trout, oh, she's based on Trout Bridge, which was a T class, which was cut down. Hi, Kelsey Jones. Um, nice to Why was Cargo intended to get the 21 inch uh, six feet torpedoes as part of the 880 fleet? When she has 24 inch torpedo tubes in her design. I have no idea. I'm still I'm still researching a lot on the Japanese Navy, and sometimes some of their decisions I just have no clue of yet still. Hello, Michael Patton. Thanks, Anna. Dr. C. During the interwar years, where in the UK did you guys store all the unused guns from the scrap ships? Uh <clears throat> Well, you see, at that time, we did have a lot of Royal Navy dockyards. Yeah, Chatham. Recife. Devonport. Portsmouth. A few others. All of them were quite large sites with a lot of warehouses. Plus, had a few other bases. Around the world with warehouses. There's a box. So, why were the Nazi destroyers so bad? They weren't bad ships. They had nice clean lines, the hulls were fine, the engines were as good as the Germans could probably make them. But... They were sort of responding to the same rule as the tribal class destroyers. They were trying to build a destroyer to do a cruiser role. And whereas the British gave it the cruiser layout, but with destroyer guns, the Germans gave it the destroyer layout with as close to cruiser guns as they could fit on a destroyer. Which meant they had a lot of singles on them. Which meant they had the... Well, how do I put this? Now. Let's say I am not like I am. And let's say there are two of me. Let's say I have really big shoulders and arms, one version of me, but is otherwise a very skinny thing. So completely overdeveloped shoulders and muscle. Like kind of maybe a, a long bowman, but without the rest of the body development that usually goes along with it. And then the other version of me, let's consider me everything built in proportion. Now, the thing is, if I manage to hit, if those two versions, if the big shoulder punching one actually hits and connects, they'll cause a lot of damage. 
But because the rest of their body isn't built to sort of support that and can't really utilize that and still provide it with the stability it needs because the rest of the body is proportional, they have a very slow rate of fire. So it's like that. Whereas the other one, which is smaller, and I'm having to say all this because I know my body is naturally battleship shaped, um, <laughs> will be doing. And the thing is, those individual hits might be slightly less powerful than the big wax, but they'll get a lot of them. And that is the problem for the German destroyers, because every time they fought British destroyers, yes, they could get in some big hits and do some damage if they actually hit. But they'd be firing... About... Well, if we consider the rate of fire of the destroyers the tribals were facing in Narvik. Destroyer going forward, ha uh, the, tri uh, the tribal going forward has four guns primed up. They have Gen 1's, let's say, two guns. Well, that sounds like it's going to be a double, but actually, no. Because these rates, of, uh, these rates of fire of these guns is they're going to be getting off about 10 to 12 shells a minute, which is very fast. The germ ones, it's going to be about 6 or so a minute because they're heavier. So it's far, let's say that's getting 6 and this is getting 10. So that's 40 shells in a minute versus 12. What are the chances of me hitting you with gutter shell, uh, uh, getting one out of 40 hitting you in a minute versus one in 12 hitting me? And then, of course, you have the advantages of salvo and director firing, all the other things that come with multiple firing, and it's just. They just get. Uh, they're just. They are very good ships on paper and certainly very powerful for fighting in the Baltic, but not really good for t doing anything in North Sea. The Narvik are the ones where they took their first fairly uh, took first fairly common design and were like, but it needs six inch guns. Yep. Hello, Brock Payne. Hello, Audric. Um, that's something I wanted to call you Derek Grover era, but in my review, but didn't want to because your ripples, uh, your ripples with colleague, your colleagues. Yes, and Eric Grove has only just recently passed on. And frankly, if I could walk in his shoes, that would be a very big promotion. There isn't anything wrong with 4.2 inch or 100 centimeter. With 4 inch and 105 and all the others, it doesn't necessarily have a niche in the in a crowded area of array of naval guns. No. Nice second. I know you must have seen my question about Tyler from Ellie. It was too long for chat. So what happens? Uh, I haven't actually seen it yet. Sorry. I've spent the day playing my dogs. <laughs> it always makes me feel bad. But um, no, I, I have spent the day playing my dogs. So I can't remember the chat. I, I, I've been mugged on the floor by a corgi and a poodle. One of which decided that I was tasty. And when I say I was tasty, yeah. Before anyone starts thinking, so the, the, basically the corgi did that one. Uh, I was sort of going, because I had the bone here, it's playing, you know how you do with puppies, that a bit, but not being cruel giveaway, just doing sort of like that, and he went to, and he caught my wrist and went, then jumped off and went, I think he was more upset than I was. 
don't worry, I gave him plenty of belly rubs afterwards. Wayne Boren, looking forward to seeing you two over here. I'm looking forward to being over there. Uh, Maybe Phalanx 21. I see, uh, don't remember, I see them as a placeholder for laser based systems, but there is a fondness place in the heart of the direct fire weapon as opposed to missile. Hmm. It would be nice to have laser based systems, but let's be honest, we have to talk sort out the attenuation issues and the power issues. Samo Schlimmer, hello! Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, make sure to visit CS Acadia, which is more directly across from HMS CS Actor. She's an amazing conserve aid awarding near a steamship who mapped most of Canada's third of world wars. I will do. Honestly, we want to visit. I, well, my plan is I'm out there is to visit archives as well as the museum ships and hopefully give some talks. If the museums would like me to, uh, if the museums or universities would like me to, because I'll do my usual thing of what Andrew always tells me, uh, Prof Lambert always tells me to do, which is, you know, when you go around these places, if you're there, it's polite to say, oh, do you want me to give a public lecture for you? Um, and it'll be fun to do so. But uh, it's going to be fun sorting it all out. I have a feeling, first of all, I'm going to have to sort out the dates, and then I'm going to have to go through and go, mm, do you want me to? But, yeah. Bottom line, Phalanx and Broken. If it works, use it. Definitely advanced technology, but also be practical. Um, I know the old saying, Feral Line, if it isn't bro if ain't broke, don't fix it. And honestly, guess what? That's actually going to come up in the video, which comes out tomorrow. The Long Patrol from Thursday's Live. And I'd say this again look at the development of missiles, look at the development of other systems. The Phalanx certainly had a place. And it was certainly a very good weapon system. It's a very good weapon system. But the thing is is it still able to do the role it was supposed to do? And I'm not convinced. But I'm also sitting here looking at it from the point of view of we are now further away from the Falklands War than the Falklands War is from was from World War Two. It's forty years from the Falklands War this year. Falklands War was 38 years, no, 37 years from World War II. The last peer conflict, or rather near peer and conflict, where the weapon systems and some of the best weapon systems in the world at the time were tested. Uh, since then, everything's been, on terms of warships, and navels at sea fighting become very, very theoretical based. And I am worried about the staying power beneath it all. So much that. Amazing little ship. She is still using her original coal fired triple expansion engines and boilers for out of service until 1969. Hmm? Cool. Alright then. Let's see how far we get. Oh, good lord, there's a lot to go through. I haven't got to them yet. Let's see. Where's my highlighted one? John Sunfreeman. On the other hand, a 40 million system would make sense as an interim. But it's hard to sell an interim. Changing a mission of a missile system is much easier to sell the voltage of that interim. Yeah. That room, 4.7 inch AA on melting glass. Wasn't that upgraded by World War II began? Or was that still, still there? Oh, good lord. You are right, though. Sorry, I forgot about that. That was when the AA 4.7 inch was the general purpose everything. Mm. This is the trouble with having the entire the entire generation of battleships not built. So that's the fact. I see it as a data system that's rolled can be better than a system like Rams. These have to 
Um, I'm not so sure. I see. You see, the thing is, I like the phalanx system as an idea and a concept. I think it's essential. I don't think the twenty millimeter cannon is necessarily the best weapon for it anymore. Twenty millimeter cannon. I think honestly, the Vulcan ca the Vulcan cannon system needs to be upgraded. I would honestly, even upgrading to a thirty millimeter would give you a better thing. And forty millimeter would give you some guided ammo, which can, or uh, programmable ammo, which can do all sorts of things. There's Vox. Does any modern arms company have Vickers fourteen inch in in infection equivalent? Um... <laughs> okay. So, all right. Um. All I'll say is this. Look at how many BAE systems, they, when they advertise, show them being fitted with a 57mm gun, okay? Just look at it. Okay? Just go through the advertising materials and you tell me. Because that gun seems to fit to everything and anywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, no, don't thank me. I'm so, uh, subbing Drax sometimes you more. No, I still thank you. <laughs> so it's nice. Um, let's see. Ooh. I'm just asking you. A Japanese 100mm dual purpose gun wasn't that good. So after from extremely quick barrel wear, they had to be replaced after 100, uh, roughly 100 shots and lose all uh, lose all. Uh, Accuracy. Bad idea in a 44. Yeah. It's in Richard. British 9.2. Why 0.2, not 9 inch or 9.5? We weren't metric then. Well, now there's a reason for that. The closer you get to 10 inch, the closer you get to having battleship level in terms of wear and tear and in terms of rate of fire. But, curiously enough, 9.2 versus 9 inch gives you a substantial increase in space and shaping you can use for fitting an explosive power. It doesn't sound like much, but it makes a big difference. So that's why 9.2. Hmm. Broadly speaking, it's 25.4 times 9, which is 175 plus um, depth. It works out as roughly 100, I think 180 millimeter, 80, 185 maybe? Yeah, 185 millimeter, I think. Just about from memory. It's a very useful gun if you can if you can use it. 180 millimeter, yeah, 180 millimeter. And we weren't metric, but our gun design teams were. They just converted it to imperial. Shrek, so, uh, thought one four two. I was thinking instead of 40 millimeter Gatling, I was thinking along the lines of the Bofors, potentially using CTA 40 derivative and multi-barrel mount to make it compact. Yeah. A lower rate of fire, but longer range in airburst. It's an option. That's here. Would it be fair to say HMS at Bell Enterprise and USS Belfast have been overshadowed by their counterparts? I don't think HMS Enterprises have been overshadowed. Honestly, having ever, if you've ever gone on a British, uh, an HMS Enterprise, you would realise that they, they don't understand the concept of being overshadowed. Probably as terms of international history, yes, but in terms of their own history, no. You know, I'm awaiting a 39 copy of Jane's Fighting Ships arrived this week. 
even though, uh, even then, how much data might have been uh, remain redacted compared to, the, say, the 38 version? <laughs> Not as much as he might wish to have done. Sure, they also had interesting choices in the power plants and like. The Germans never realized that when you build a warship, not every one of them should be a test bed. No, the Germans don't understand many things when it comes to warship design. That's just one of the beginning ones. And um, as that's key, the main problem with German destroyers is that they couldn't travel to Narvik and back on a single refuel. Oh, yes. But not many ships can. Frank Spartan, let's see. I was asking the story question because the pick you have. Looks like the guns were an afterforce, and anything laying around will do. Mm, pretty much that's the case. Time for a book. Yes. Sorry. What's the trouble? I get ra in in raptured in the questions. So, I have done a bit of a discussion in Long Patrols, but I'm going to start off by talking about this one. Okay, British Shipbuilding, 1500 to 2010, by Anthony Slavin. Now... You have all been, you, there's a long patrol coming out, and there's long patrol. I will go into I go into this as much as, as well. And I'm the long patrols are going to be four episodes, and then they're coming out on the Mondays to go with the live that was, was out on Thursday. But I wanted you to see the sources and discuss them a bit. This is the sort of book which you will love if you want tables and if you want to understand. What's being built where? Um, right, so let's say district company structures, and this is in 1910. And this is country, this is basically uh, how do I put this? Um, Companies involved in ship construction. There are eight public companies. Nine private companies. Five proprietary companies. Total of 22 in Glasgow. Between Greenock and Port Glasgow, there's another 12 private companies. Another four pri proprietors and another... Well, that's about like six, sixteen total. In total, in nineteen ten, Britain had a hundred and four companies. that were registered as building ships large enough for oceanic trade. And the limited company, uh, the companies of shipbuilding, uh, the, their sort of their capitalization, Vickers Limited, based in Barrow, were, had a... Uh, Limited uh, capitalization limit of 5.2 million. Armstrong Whitworth, 4.2 million. John Brown Company, 4 million. Beardmore and Company, 2 million. This is all from the 1910 stock exchange. You end up with a total from the top 18 companies. Have a cumulative authorized value of about 24.8 million pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot today, but put it in 1910 money. That's a lot. If I go to my trustly, the trusty uh, uh, website I tend to use for these things. Uh, 
Um, if I put 24, eight, go away. Yes, I accept your invasion of my privacy. I don't care. Moment. Um, that today is a market value of three point one billion. And I think that's a little bit soft. Because that's based in purchasing power rather than other options. Um, but that's still fairly a fairly decent amount. So, very, very cool book. Uh, there won't be a link to it in this video. There will be a link to it in the video which is coming out on Monday, which is the day after this video. So there'll be a link. There's a link to go and find this book on on Amazon. Very shit volume. It's got full of stats. Um, what I'm going to do is I have to admit, because I'm doing two books on ship building and I've got four other books. So I'll do the two ship building books together. So this book and this book are both good. Okay. They're both written by a guy called Anthony, but this is written by Anthony um, Burton and this is by Anthony Slavin. No ideas, but no idea why, but guys called Anthony seem to write books on shipbuilding. That tells you really what you need to know. This is a narrative history, which is very lovely to read. This is facts and figures, as well as the story and all the evidence. This is what you read if you want a quick and you want a, not a quick, but dirty, but a, a quick and a quick rounded view. This is what you want if you want a deep rounded view of construction and British shipbuilding. Both are very good books. Both are worth it. And I'm going to put, put a little note in the system that I did the shipbuilding books at roughly the hour mark. Ah, oh, right, let's get on to the last one. Mm -hmm. Frank I was thinking, I was asking storage question because the pick you have looks like the guns were an afterthought. Yeah, I'll answer that one. Yes, they were. Um... <laughs> Shrike one thought, we'll either do a video on the GW designer series. I think they're very interesting. What if? And wonder what would have happened if they'd been built instead of the Tigers. Yeah, I probably will do. I'm slightly getting around to them. There's a Vox though. Weird question. Why was there never a coalition against the UK? There was attempts to contain all rising powers in Europe, assure, uh, 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 contain all rising powers in Europe, assure from the UK. Uh, there were coalition wars against the UK. Just the UK tended to build coalitions to fight them. And also, you have to remember, for a coalition to work for much of history, you need someone to bankroll the coalition. And it tended to be that the ones who could bankroll the coalition were the British. 
because we actually had cash. Other countries were rich on paper. <laughs> Britain tended to actually have some money. <laughs> it makes a difference. It's a case of, if you look in the history and people go, well, they, but technically this country was richer than Britain. And you go, yes, but which one could actually get cash to actually pay for things? Ah, yeah. Uh, the old story. France is rich on paper. Britain tends to have the cash. And as we all know, cash is always king. Second, would you agree that Tayo is an example of how not to build an armored aircraft carrier? I think Tayo is an attempt for a first armored carrier, but you needed a little bit more thought before you could get to it. Come guys, read Colgi. I had a similar set of stuff with pet rats, fungus, I think. So. Were they embarrassed and apologetic? Book, please. Okay. Mm. I'd love to go to Poland. But for some reason my family gets worried about me going that close to Russia. Be it unknown. The Pier de War, the Iran Iraq War, I'm not really sure we'll call that. Uh, that that's a bit of an interesting one. Well, I react and tracked what I said about a good fulfilling. So you bring up good points. Appreciate the various CLS mounts we've used, but also but it'd be the opinion that our ships were unarmed. And that's really the problem. If you uh, honestly, as I said, the phalanx is very good software. And that's one of the problems when you start arguing against it. People go, well, it's very accurate. All the yes, it is. I love the, the phalanx as a concept, is fine. The phalanx as a concept. But you've got the CRAM version of the phalanx, but the trouble is that's only got. Nine rounds, as a rule, it can. No, can it take more than nine rounds? But it is, there's not that many rounds, and then you have to reload it. And as I show with a picture when we were talking about logistics, and I showed the reloading of it at sea and the complication of reloading at sea, people were going, "Ah, yeah, it's not quick to reload." And that's the thing: none of the missile systems are quick to reload at sea. This is why you need the gun systems, and. Um, I like the idea of a laser. I, in my world, I would have a laser gun combo, and I'd be almost tempted to go. Well, if you've got a laser, then a double, uh, then a pair of forty millimeters on one side, and a laser on the other side, and the can uh, and the phalanx system in the middle, sort of, sort of, some sort of version like sort of R two D two Robocop mix. That seems a sensible system to me to transition to, because then you've got the forty millimeter there as backup if you run out of power. Or the laser isn't working, and you've got the laser to provide the rapid fire that you like for your can that you want to replace at twenty millimeter. Really, the, the sort of the, the um the oh, Gatling phalanx, but it's it's going to require some thought. It's going to require someone actually stepping up and going, you know what? Actually, we do need to make a change because everyone's stuck in the rut. The twenty millimeter phalanx. How long will nations build for not with railguns if railguns are always five way, uh, five years away? Uh, for as long until they find something better to build for? Hello, Italian military archives. Oh, if you haven't seen IMA's newest video, you're missing out. It's a good one. Hello, Jack. Right. Nice hearing. Would it be fair to say to a central rise units of Belfast have been overshadowed by the Cambots? I think I'll answer that one. And JSL, problem with the phalanx is ammo capacity. Yes, but again, we're building even bigger ships. For goodness sake, can we make some blooming space for 40 millimeter ammo? <laughs> uh, I said, why did Reuter think the British would seize the high seas fleet or that the Germans would reject the treaty? And what good was the high seas fleet to the Royal Navy if they had seized them? Uh, well, basically, the Germans were dulled into believing that that was what the British might do, so they would do it. I always felt that, that I am uh, the Royal Navy, the best currents the British could have was the German high seas fleet to sink itself. Because they didn't want everyone else getting those ships. They didn't want them themselves because they weren't particularly good for them, because they would have been entirely new logistics uh, and line. Basically, if you consider the Royal Navy looked at Bayern and went, Nah, thank you. 
you know, you couldn't have a ship which, on the face of it, is closer to the Queen Elizabeth class than that. And the British were going, mm, no way. It's a... If the British had got to the German and the high sea fleet and been forced to use them, they'd have used them. But that would have been a huge number of warships. That would allow the Royal Navy to wipe out pretty much any other navy in the world. In fact, every other navy in the world. Because they'd have used the high seas fleet to protect the UK, manned with British crews. And then the British fleet would have gone around the world t attacking everyone else. Because that's what you use. You use the short-range German fleet to protect the UK and beat up the French and probably any one of the Italians. Um, and the Russians if they come out. And then you use the British fleet to go and beat up the Americans and the Japanese and crown yourselves ruler of the world. Otherwise, there's no real point, though, in that. And this is what we're talking about at the end of World War One. We're talking about 1918 and the various fleet numbers then. Probably some of the older dreadnoughts as well get left with the um, high sea fleet to round out its numbers. Ooh, Diotto Malera 76mm submerged slammer is also another equivalent of the 14 inch. But the thing is, mm, the trouble is that a 57mm and a 46mm and a 57mm is both of them work quite well. Did you see them in person? Can't remember where that comes from. Um, P. Dana, but nice track, uh, drank, uh, be nice to, uh, to drag this evening, folks. He was absolutely knackered yesterday on his dry deck. Long shooting day in Pompeii. Yeah. Uh, he did. Also, he's done Bill Trumps this morning. We had a we recorded Bill Trumps this week this morning because he had recording on uh, Friday and Saturday, so he was very tired. Scenario, no, no, no. The scenario: the battle cruiser concept with the Invincibles fails horribly, and it turns out Blucher type armor cruiser is the right way to go. What changes to naval design? Um, honestly, battleships probably get faster. And you probably still have the Queen Elizabeth class. Uh, you possibly had the Queen Elizabeth class come out earlier, as in a 25 knot battleship come out earlier. But you also probably have a heavy cruiser design. That's what they're called. And you probably didn't have that functioned into the treaty. So they probably stay at roughly the 20,000 ton mark. But it's difficult to see how it could have failed. It depended on why it failed and why the concept of judgment could have failed. Because honestly, honestly, the, the next generation of battlecruisers were being ordered before the first generation were even in the water. Military, IMA, hello. Internal military archives, Professor. We could make a live show talking about the Battle of Calabria and Cape Spartavento confronting Italian British perspectives. Ooh, that'd be fun. We'll have to do that at some point. Chat to me and we'll do it. Be cool to do. So much to My main issue with Phalanx is that you are trusting a close range system to destroy modern peer to peer missiles at close range. Uh, let's be honest, let's remember the, the CIWS is the last of the ditch. It's basically everything else has failed, but it's, it's better than nothing. But I would still like to pump it up to actually give it a chance of actually doing it. Well, that's quick. Having listened to your reasoning regarding the 9.2 inch gun, so there would be a merit in investing in a modern triple 9.2 inch turret with the modern type auto loaders and program ammunition for Type 83. Oh, yes. A uh, modern triple 9.2 would be absolutely freaking scary. It would also be quite cool to watch the army's face. Man <laughs> Freeman, eyes and ears pick up a book. While well, listen to be read, pal, the grown book. They are good books. They are fun to read. Um, this one is the easier read. It's also the quicker read, because that's going to be that size. But it's still a good book. This one is... How do I put it? 
This one is the one you read if you just want to read one book on the subject. If you read this one, you will go away with a lot of questions and want to find more books, and it gives you a great directory to go and look at them. This is sort of, if I you just want an overview, a one book overview of British shipbuilding, you buy this one. If you want, are really interested in this topic and you want to go in and go further and look at more books, you get this one. They're both a lot of fun to read, though. Oh, you're at 737. K. Okay. I, I think I'm at 7,370. Or something like that. I'm not sure. I have no... I, I, I don't tend to watch. <sighs> I, I, I'm hoping I get to 10,000 at some point this year. Mainly because at that point I can probably, this is going to sound strange, at 10,000, I'm now, my accountant and I are fairly sure with mass working out that I can afford to say goodbye to one of my more annoying jobs, which I do. I, I, I do sometimes look at Drak and go, you've made this your income stream and you've managed to do very well, my friend. And I'm both proud of you, happy for you, and slightly je jealous of you. Because you don't have to deal with any office politics anymore. And I still have to deal with it in multiple companies. I multiple universities. <laughs> oh. So I understand. Why would you put your last ring of defense in the hands of a gun when a missile can do it better in effectively all aspects? Because uh, missiles aren't that great, aren't always perfect, especially not at the really close range stuff. And they sometimes require time to engage. But also, there's the amount of missiles you can carry, there's reloading missile launchers, and reload, uh, you know, all these things stack up, and in the end, having a gun is useful. A gun is a good general purpose tool. And that's the other thing you have to remember about the planets, is it can be used to engage a lot of systems. It can be used to engage torpedo boats and other things in closely in the waters. And one of the interesting conversations I had with someone was a few years ago was basically going, yeah, well, when you're going things places like the Suez Canal, etc., Phalanx is really quite hopeful because that's the closest sort of ranges you're going to be dealing with any attack from. Some, uh, some sources put the minimum range of seas that there are 500 meters. Ew. Let's put it this way. I love the sea scepter. I'm a big fan of it. But again, you look at the density of, we of load of weaponry and ammunition and war shots you get. Sea scepter versus the phalanx. Phalanx is your backup. It's lightweight, gives you a lot of backup, and you always want the layers. You want the layers, and you don't carry enough missiles. Plus, it's getting enough of the missiles. Again, shells, 20mm, 40mm, are a lot cheaper than missiles. Atanavaka? You just finished the dry dock. I have no idea how long today's dry dock was. I'm pretty sure it was massive. I haven't managed to see it yet today. I said it was playing the dogs. Thanks for that. Dr. C and Dan, how popular is the name John in the UK? Pretty popular. Uh, I don't think adjusted translation work as well as the 1950s cost of the, uh, the building the new 
New York has the Buffalo, New York, and New York systems freeway. Just for inflation, it's less than the modern cost of replacing on a, 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 a big bridge on the highway. Hmm. I think modern frigate designs don't... Well, the Canadian service combat is a variation on Type 26. And I would point out that the other navies involved in the Type 26 program have gone for it. And I would argue that to an extent they've gone for it from their scenario. If your scenario is you think you are going to be fighting in open ocean, then I can understand why you go for... You might say, well, I can I can use the phalanx weight for other things. But having a close in weapon system such as phalanx gun base system, if you're going to be fighting in waters, let's say like the South China Sea potentially, or the mm, Norway in Norway areas of White Sea sort of <sighs> Barrent Sea and North Sea, North Atlantic, and possibly even the Falklands, then you want that close in with firepower. Right, combat involves dynamic elements which will boil down to which will boil down to things that will go wrong. And they do. So you have layers and you have overlap between those layers to give you backup. That's right. All right, how does the RN getting one mermaid frigate, seven Salisbury, five leopard frigates, and 12 Blackwood and nine Rossi, and 26 land and six would be 23 tribal frigates affect the Cold War in Europe? Uh, the Royal Navy is going to be a lot more present. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. The Royal Navy has a lot more presence. The Royal Navy has a lot of frigates for starters. Um, yeah, you're basically dealing with the Royal Navy having best part of eighty frigates. <laughs> That's a lot of presence. <clears throat> and that's a lot of anti submarine warfare capability. But it's a lot of presence. Nice one. Should the Type 21 frigate be an example of why letting company design your ship is a bad idea? Not really. They were built innovative, and they were quite interesting. Kevin, uh, Kevin, hello, Kevin. Which three UK animals who do not have a warship named after them so far, but deserve to? Ooh, Duncan got one. Um... We haven't had a Cunningham, a Vian, or a Somerville. In fact, none of the World War II animals have ever had it. Honestly, most of the Age of Sail ones who actually would deserve it have had one. Thanks to Jeffrey and Hal. Uh, go, uh, go uh, but yeah. It's complicated, really, because there have been a fair number of good admirals, and I would like an HMS clap, but again, uh, that, that there is something about the sailor's mindset which might not make that a sensible idea. I think I'm running about 15 minutes behind you all. Come to Hungary then. Maybe. Uh, Franks, obviously, if you replaced UK and Japan, how do you think Japan and French relations would have been? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, good lord. Japanese versus Fr the French. That would have been fun to watch. I have a feeling there would have been a lot of a lot of very interesting and very upset Frenchmen. But there again, there always were interesting and upset Frenchmen. Hmm. What guys Did the Allies and future allies? Yes, have any actual plans made up of Britain fell in early World War II? Panic. The British fleet and the Royal Navy and the British Army also were supposed to evacuate to Canada and run themselves from Canada. That was apparently the official plan. Uh, but pretty much panic was it. So much also to say. Have you considered a video on World War One Canadian subs? Um, yeah, I have, but I want to do some more. I, I said, I, the one reason I want to go to Canada is I want to go to your, the Canadian Naval Archives in Halifax and visit Sackville while I'm there, also spend some time in the archives and go through them. Fraulein, I've been concerned about the stagnation of the close and well systems due to the wrong attitude of fighting last wars. It's more a case of the whole, um, it sounds good, so we'll just leave it as it is. And we have all these theories about how it's going to work to justify leaving it as it is. And you sit there and go, yeah, but the world is changing. Now, guys, Rear Phalanx, that would be the Russian cash down. Otherwise, the Ford's ESSM, RAM, and 20mm layers are nice for that ship. Mm-hmm. There's Fox. Is there a naval equivalent of the A10, a ship that's super overrated but obsolete and where people focus on the wrong thing? Hmm. Uh... See, I really like the Ticos. I really do like the Ticos. And I always, they've always been good ships, but are now very old. And honestly. They're being they're in, still in service because Congress keeps saying we want to keep them, but the U.S. Navy's replacements keep failing. And that's kind of like what's happened with the A-10 in that the things which are supposed to replace it have kept churning out not to be as good at doing it, the what things it does. It does well. Mainly because they do things in a different way. The A-10 comes in and blasts things up at close range, which is great. But no one wants to do that anymore. They want to do standoff. Daniel's politics one. Isn't the standard view that what the RN wanted from the high sea fleet, I'm presuming we're on the ground fleet, was and that no one else got it? Pretty much the RN's goal. <clears throat> Hmm. Frank Snyder, don't see if the Scottish got to name the two Queen of Car Queen of uh, CVs. What do you think names would be? Depends who in Scotland is naming them. Potentially Queen Elizabeth will still get one. Um, maybe Duke of Edinburgh. <laughs> be the other. Uh. There's all sorts of debate on that one. That's one over a bit. Depends who's naming it in Scotland. Depends who's naming it. If it was a branch of my family, it would be the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh. Um, Queen Elizabeth II, that is, rather than Queen Elizabeth I. If it was... Some of my, let's put this way, more interesting friends in Scotland who have differing views from me on politics. Uh, it would probably be more independently minded in their naming, let's say.
Mm. That's what I'm saying. The phalanx has an ammo drum on the external mount, limited equal to capacity. Russian film military CRS have ammo storage in the hull. On a bigger ship, you can have a large magazine for them. Yeah. It's a case of we could do things, but no one's actually done it. Strike one for two. What does it say? Does it type into free article? Uh... Waiting for Drax final notes. And then she got up. Because we made more notes because we had something to come back. So, yeah. But no, don't. I'm t uh, he he's getting all that. He's been blooming busy the last last week. So these things. But the moment it's done, it's go it's going straight up on the site. Basically, that's what they said. I don't know, daft question, Doctor, but how do I find the Build Trunks recordings, please? Simple cast or iTunes? Both have them on them. Well, I'm just uploading episode 78 tonight as, you, as we speak. Uh, Colin Cameron, I view laser defences as a pipe dream until we have a quantum leap in computation and power supply density, much like hologram tech. Um, honestly, laser defenses are viable to an extent now. They've actually been deployed on some ships. But it's getting them to shrink down. And that's more a factor of not just the power supply, but a factor of our lens design and shaping. And I think, honestly, I'd say it's more when we can reach a level of lens design, which is beyond... is about a factor of 10 better than we have it we are able to achieve now in workable solutions Frank Swallow, how big is the IS2 tank large than tiger roughly cool nice to don't see all the history question how does the Cold War play out if superpowers of the USA, USSR, and the British Empire? Which is in good money state thanks to insert sci fi world problem advancing tech. Solving tech. I don't know. Uh, let's see. What solving tech would economically would solve it? Let's say. Ooh. Let's say the British had managed to convert energy into matter, i.e., with a. Uh, replicator system and had been able to use renewable energy sources i.e. windmills and hydroelectricity uh, to supply the power necessary and use it in World War II to build all the ships and planes and other pieces of equipment they need instead of having to spend lots of money importing it and also food etc so they didn't have to import food and things from abroad. So let's say they have that and so they don't have to get into the debt they do and they sort of survive. How does that affect things? Well, you probably still have China rising as a superpower. Nothing's going to really affect that, but you don't have a balanced system. And you might well have a different version of NATO appear. It wouldn't be so much a US-centered version, but a sort of Anglo-American shared version of NATO, but it would be spread out around the, the Commonwealth, as it probably would be called, because the British were always planning on heading towards a Commonwealth because that was the more economically sensible way to road. So you probably have the Commonwealth as this large economic, political sort of grouping alliance around the world. And America would have tacked on, and uh, other Western nations would have probably tacked onto that and formed it into some sort of higher alliance. So you probably have some sort of version of that facing off on one side versus Russia and China led communist nations on the other side. Um. Honestly, probably wouldn't have changed that much about the course of the Cold War. 
other than making it a lot more expensive. And they allow the Americans to focus more on the Pacific. Probably, again, you get spheres of influence being carved out with the Americans taking the lead in the Pacific and the British taking the lead in Europe and the Atlantic and Mediterranean. With America providing a, a sort of basically both of them being the primary and the secondary in each theatre. So the British Commonwealth will be the secondary power in the Pacific area. And the American, the Brit, uh, the uh, and the primary and European theatre and Mediterranean, etc., North Atlantic, and the Americans will be the primary in the Pacific theatre and the secondary in the European theatre in that scenario. Out of that scenario, where you have, as I said, the economic scenario, the only way you could really do it is if you invent some form of replicator tech, a Star Trek style replicator tech, energy to matter. Watch it. It's small and lighter, but gun is 122mm. Not best gun if you try to break through the enemy lines. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Watch it. I, smaller and lighter of the IS 2 versus a Tiger is a relative term. Especially as it evolves into the IS 3. Berlin. I just remember that my gunner's mate days in the Navy that the phalanx was considered to work in conjunction with the rapid fire gun mounts firing frag projectiles. That's pretty old. Mm hmm. I'm going to drag you six hours again. Ah, oh, good lord. Well, I'm not doing six hours this evening. I'm, I've got a war wound. That's my defense. Uh, 78 will be out on Tuesday or Wednesday. 78 will be out Wednesday. Yeah. Normal time. Normal date. Tom Southworth, is there a possibility to get a signed version of your book? Uh, yes, I have a whole load of signatures I need to do on, on signed papers, which will go back to um, Pen and Sword, who will then be dealing with signed copies of books. Because basically that was my idea, that, that they've they, they sent me sheets which I'm going to sign and put on. And there's also going to be signed copies of books, which are going to be prizes for things, etc. when I start. When the next batch of boxes, uh, that next batch of books arrive, there are a few signed copies going out already, and there'll be a couple signed copies um, produced for prizes. How am I six hundred six five? Roger, Viper is already doing it, and A ten is upgraded for at least some F sixteen potential. Hmm. Frank Spanner, what was the purpose of HMS Mermaid? Well, let's first get a picture of HMS Mermaid to put up here to replace this old picture. Uh, I'm presuming... Yeah. She's the, oh, let's find a picture of it. F-76, come on. Do, 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 do. Yes, the gun, oh, what a vessel which was designed for the Garden Navy.
Now, it's a rather good looking ship, I always think, the Mermaid. You have to remember, she was originally designed for... Well, she was based on a modified version of the Type 41 and 61 frigates. But she was designed for the Garnon Navy. And she had extra accommodation areas in the infrastructure, line, dining and conference room, in order to suit her role as occasionally going to be diplomatic vessel. It was to have been named originally Black Star and function as the flagship of Ghana's Navy, as well as presidential yacht for Kwane Nakamura, the then president of Ghana. Of Ghana. Um, basically, she's built and launched in 1966. She's completed in 1968 and is kept at anchor, waiting for several years for a buyer. In 1971, the Conservative government that's elected then decides that if they purchase it, they can get a ship for the Royal Navy and give a indirect subsidy to the very nice people of Yarrow Shipbuilders and make sure they keep going. It's kind of like a interwar period idea. And what the British had traditionally done both after and before the treaty system. So then she's transferred and brought into operational standards and joins the Royal Navy. Where she serves for a few years, she's quite useful, and she has some issues, and then she transfers to the Royal Malaysian Navy in 1977, and this is actually her picture then, when she's named Hyung Ta. Um, and served as the flagship of the Royal Malaysian Navy. She retired in 2018 and has been turned into a museum ship. She's a cute looking ship. But basically her entire history is one of people not wanting her. And her being a one off. Concurrent, both a missile and a shell can be used as a proximity fuse canister shot, but a missile has a much larger canister of the same number of ball bearings. Hmm. So, was there someone in your family that would warrant an HMS Clark? Sadly, no. Most of my family did, um... How do I put it? The kind of duties, especially the ones named Clark, which would not get them a ship name for. they get a medal. They might even get some grudging respect, but they wouldn't get a ship. And the Jacobs were even more like that. I won't get into the Brownings and the Goslings. It's going back to grandparents' names. Well, well, they're maiden names. <laughs> Dr. Knight of Hope. Hello. Hi, Dogsy. Who are the top animals in history you'd love to sit and have a pint with? Well, I'd like to have a pint with Henderson and Vian, as long as I'm having a pint of Ambrew. Um, I quite like to have a chat with Collingwood, and I quite like to have a chat with Duncan. Those would be the four. And really, if you're going to have a nice drink and chat, you don't want more than four or five. If you only have more than four or five people at the table, you don't, You can hardly hear anyone speak. So this is the thing. Instead of it's, if you're going to sit down, it's four or five. So if I've got four admirals, it's me happy. I've sat and had drinks with a fair number of the admirals who are currently living and Commodores are currently living and chatted away with them. So, you know. I've even watched a. <clears throat> uh, he promised I, I. I promised him that I would never reveal his name for saying this out loud in case his wife ever watched any of my videos. But a very interesting retired officer, one who I have 
worked with a lot over the years, down a pint of iron brew in a pub in London, which at that time served iron brew by the pint, and you could you had a tap for it. And uh, yeah, went up for a second. So I'm just saying, definitely the HMS Fisher. Well, the trouble is we've had HMS Fishers, um, but they're usually they're named for something other than the Admiral. Pinanum, hmm, the Windsor's in Canada. Trees in the mall had demolition charges to provide for a DC-3, and Windsor was long enough for the flight to Canada, to Cardiff, and then to Canada. Uh... Peter, there, there are some wonderful ideas, but there's also an idea that they would be using a submarine and all sorts of things to get across. The reality is that if anyone lands in the south of England, they're probably taken up to the north and to Scotland, and they're going to be put on a battleship, and they're going to go that way. That's what they would do. They'd be spirited up the country. Train. Whoosh, the Royal Train was ready to go. Getting the king aboard it would be a different matter, but I'm sure... The Queen Mum, as we now know her, but the Queen at the time, would more than likely have gone, Here, husband, I've got a handkerchief for you. <sniffs> yeah, bring him. Your Majesty, are you supposed to drug your husband? We are taking him with us, he's not being an idiot. Roger. Now, better result than loads of 30 mm roofing, everything, friend of foe, is the example of the guided 70 mm rocket. Hmm. Uh, friend of mine, it's been disconcerting to see naval war missile warfare being based on 75 years of theory. We haven't yet had a full blown ship to ship, uh, ship to ship surface action in peer to peer battle space. We came very close in the Falklands War, but didn't actually get there. And on 635, why navies, RN, USN, German, and French seem to be buying more frigates over destroyers? Have the lines between cruiser, destroyer, and frigates blurred that much? It is. Yes and no. Some navies are buying frigates because they like the anti-submarine warfare focus of surface ships, and because it explains why they're so lightly armed if they're called a frigate. <clears throat> There's a frog sir. Given your general focus on politics and logistics, could you do a video on how Operation Sea Lion wouldn't be able to happen? Uh, and what the RN's response to the Nazi preparations? General de Munkin could ask. I think I have done a bit of a video in the past on that, but I wouldn't mind doing another one. I'll see. It depends on what I get. It's going to sound strange. I always look at it based on what I get when I'm plotting out the videos I'm going to do for next month. I look at what are the patron suggestions. Which are still open at the moment. The patron vote will go live tomorrow. And what are the things that people might uh, might be interested in in terms of what happened that month over the centuries, and what I feel feel like doing, and I would like to do that. But I think I would do Operation Sea Line if I was going to do it. I'd want to do it. Hmm. Probably actually this year is fairly good for that, because then it's completely over. There's no chance of them getting enough in 1942. <laughs> Well, there is a debate over HMS Hampshire. Um, 
as Frank Sondor was talking in the movie Kingsman and Hunter is torpedoed by a sub, what do you think happened to it? Uh, my view has always been that it was a minefield. Mainly because that is backed up by the German evidence and the British evidence. And honestly, mines are the real problem. And the really successful system for the Germans. So again, it's something... <sighs> You see, if I'd been designing the wolf pack system in World War II for the Germans, I would have probably done the buddy-buddy system. So I'd have had submarines which are designed to tail convoys, and I'd have submarines which are designed to drop off a load of mines. They'd all be armed with torpedoes, and if they wanted to engage with torpedoes and guns, they could do. But literally, there'd be submarines which were fast underwater submarines, whose job was to tail a convoy, and provide updates on where it was. And then another, that providing that details, to come, go back to headquarters. If you're going to direct them, you might as well then have another submarine up in front laying mines. And then you can devastate a convoy with two submarines. Because that's ultimately the problem for the convoy, uh, for the wolf pack system. And this is the other, the flip of the coin we often f forget when I'm talking about. Uh, submarine warfare in World War Two. The Germans need a lot of submarines to overwhelm a British com a, a, a convoy. They can do it, but they need to mass them up to get more than the escorts and get in. Especially after the convoys realize, after the Royal Navy realizes that submarines have a habit of popping up in the center of their convoys, which they've never done on exercises because, again, all the ships involved had been RFAs, which had a gun on them. So you didn't pop up in the middle of an exercise in a convoy because you would get sunk by the RFA. So that wasn't going to work. But you could do that in the middle of a merchant convoy because those ships didn't have guns on them. But mines would have been a really big problem for them. DF, was running out of food ever real ratio, or can the crews fish, or would gas run out far sooner? Mm, it's rare, but ships can run out of food. So anyway, imagine you use First Nation with a hologram system mountable on warships. How would you use it? Hologram as in being able to present an image to the world, or hologram as in I can make my own doctors? Because if I can make my own doctors and crewmen, then I've just fixed a lot of issues with personnel. In that I now have a engineering spe an engineering specialist, a medical specialist, all those specialist personnel I normally have to have on ship, I can get rid of them. It won't be my chief engineer, that'll be a human, and there'll be a still a human crew, but I'll have a computer, a hologram engineer who can work all day. Brilliant. Don't worry, Stafford. Thank you for being here. But guys, anyway, what was the last non-small arms gun that was commonly shared between the con uh, countries, the ar army and navy? Um, hmm. Hundred millimeter, one hundred five, possibly. Let's see, how did the Indonesia get in and get in on the Type 31s? Uh, <clears throat> the British government had been going around offering Type 31s to everyone. They want them to sell, they want them to be sold. Basically, they're supposed to be the foreign export some a ship and they want it sold to the Borod. Ooh, good lord. Right. Really far behind on the questions. 
Um, Mojo, size of ship isn't as costly as it was before. Size is a small part of the price, but gives a lot, lot when we talk about survivability and upgrade potential. Electronics is a killer. Yeah, especially making sure those electronics are cool enough and maintained enough and protected enough from vibrations. I don't know, a little bit of an old history, but if all four all powers gain four battle cruisers in the Washington Naval Treaty, what would change? <laughs> uh, if we're talking basically they stand by as everyone gets four battle cruisers as well as their armed fleet, uh, you're gonna have a panic attack because that would mean the US Navy would have four to versus the Japanese Navy four. So the Americans would be upset, the British would be more, more upset because they'd be having to deal with potentially eight and when they're four. Um, yeah, it would just, that would break down the Washington Naval Treaty quicker than anything. It, it would just wipe it out. So let's say, you know, let, let's say they're all allowed five. Uh, Britain and America are allowed five each. Let's go for that. And capital ships, uh, battleships are kept separate. They're in their own class. Let's say you're allowed 15 of those and five battle cruisers. So you're allowed four squadrons for the uh, for each of those. Then the Japanese would be allowed seventy percent. Let's uh, so they'd be allowed fourteen ships. Now the question would be whether that's three and eleven or four and eleven, uh, four and ten. Probably would be four and ten, four battle cruisers and ten battleships, because the Americans would view the battle cruisers as less of a worry than the battleships. Although the British would view the battle cruisers as more of a worry, so it might actually cause a fight. And it's more sensible to round up battleships. So maybe they get three and eleven battleships. And then proportionally. I can't see Italy and France wanting more than six each, but I could see them ending up with going, okay, we're allowed six battleships and two battle cruisers each. So that becomes a standard for that level of power. And that might as well stabilize. It's going to change things in that it's going to mean from the beginning you have both the Royal Navy and the American Navy thinking about fast squadrons based on their battle cruisers in terms of carrier design. So you could well have an impact. Also, there's the fact that if you're doing that, and it, let's say Britain is building theirs around, has got four renowns, an admiral as their, far, as their five, the British well, might well turn around and go, no, we need more. We need to build two new... If, you're, if, you're, if the Americans are all brand new ships, because they're building five Lexingtons, the British will turn around and go, well, we have to build new, some new ones as well. So the British will probably end up with two new battle cruisers and two new battleships with 16-inch guns. So they have two rounds, two at the hood, and two whatever. Could also affect carrier design. It could really affect carrier design because suddenly the British have got to make their battle cruisers work far are far harder, which means they've got to be scouting. And again, the bit the early the early thing that's really pushing carrier design and carrier development for the Royal Navy was sea control, as in being able to search the wide areas of ocean. And we we and that's one of the reasons why it le leads to aircraft as they operate further afield and further away from the ship becoming multi-crewed because they need their navigator board so yeah that could that that can actually have an interesting impact it's, it's quite long right so obviously what a tribal class frigate is good at the DEs? not really 
Right, George Newman, how do we get Build Trumps 1 to 3? You can find them on the SimSec website, and they're as part of their Sea Control podcast series there, and linked into that. The end of this Vox, the Royal Navy gets their CVN and a sister ship in the Cold War. What effect does this have on the Cold War around Ireland? Does the UK stay a major naval power? If the British have got a CVN, let's say... I don't know, what would become, what could potentially become a CVN? Let's say the British are building a CVN as part of their nuclear program for the repl the, the, the in the nineteen seventies for the instead of CVA one is a nuclear powered vessel a nuclear powered supercarrier if they've got a pair or more likely knowing the British at the time it would be free would they say yes they would say major naval power because they've got free nuclear powered aircraft carriers. Other than America, they'd be the largest nuclear carrier fleet in the world. They'd have to invest in the aircraft and things and escorts to go with them. But if you've made that much big and that big an investment, you've already gone there. That at this point, you have twenty minutes to do two more books and let us watch Drac. Uh It's now eight o'clock and I'm behind. Whee. But here is the other book. Another book. Okay, so I'm just going to put this into the timing. I think I'm going to go have a massive drop off in people. This is um, one of the Britannic Naval History Series, or the Britannia Naval College History Naval History Series, and it's Rise of the Aircraft Carrier. And it's Pacific Naval Strategy, 1941 to 45. And it's got an, an introduction by James Berrigan. And... Tom Meaden, Joshua Manning, and Sub Lieutenant W. A. Paling are in. It's got stuff from Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz in it, senior, and Marshal Admiral Isorikuro Yumoto, both discussed. It's got illustrations of aircraft carriers. It's got pre war situation. It's got all the planning. And it's got some very interesting stuff in here. And honestly, I was set up to try to like this book. I was really hoping to like this book. And some of the stuff in here is frankly amazing in terms of source material. And some of the designs and the appendixes. Let's see that one here there. Um, the various details, etc. they're getting into charts and the operational areas all these things are very very cool but there are also some chapters in here where i am sitting there and going that's a very old thinking on that particular topic and when i say old thinking it sort of it's the stuff which i would expect to read from books and journal articles dated 15, 20 years ago in terms of their appreciation and understanding of it. There are some interesting things in here. 
But there is one line which I really did have a problem. Naval aviation did not develop rapidly in the 1920s and early 1930s because of a lack of technological progress in military aviation that ensured World War I doctrine dominated tactics. In addition, due to financial constraint on in the interwar years, the RN and the USN were not able to budget for substantial technological research into air capabilities due to war debt and the recession of the late 1920s, seeing their battleship oriented navies as a reliable deterrents against hostile threats. Despite the increasing pace of technological change, such continuing constraints on naval aviation lasted into the 1930s, resulting in the Royal Navy having to use the entirely unsuitable Blackburn Skewer dive bomber as a fleet fighter before the outclass Fairy Fulmar came along and then adapting the Hulk Hurricane for carrier deployment, which, in the nicest way, I like this book is useful because of some of the content in it and it's got really interesting and really cool stuff. But some of the analysis is if you're going to claim that the fairy Fulmar is outclassed, then you have to point out how well, you have to ask how so many of its pilots became aces and how it did so, as well as it did and why it didn't get swatted aside. The Blackburn Skewer, I can agree, is not, not a fighter, but it's actually a world class dive bomber. And it was in procured as a fighter, as a fighter rather than dive bomb, because of the system that was in place with the air ministry and the control of things. It was necessary as part of the system. The point is that's very that's old thinking. Um. Yeah. And it's one of those things. I, 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 I'm reading this book and I'm reading the discussions in it. And I think they, I think the trouble is some of the stuff in here is reading history backwards rather than forwards. Definitely. But it's a good, still an interesting book to get and part of the Britannia Naval History series, which as you all know, I love. I do really love that series. Right. And then uh, Leo Gazebo. Hello, I heard during World War II, British Navy still carries some weapons intended for any potential boarding action. So I'm going to be thinking, do other nations have the something similar? Yes, they still carry swords and occasionally some of them carry pikes. And even to this day, they still sometimes carry these weapons. The Royal Navy still carries fully armed boarding uh, boarding teams which can have bayonets, uh, have bayonets on their guns. Um... If the US never left the Commonwealth, do you think the capital of Commonwealth would eventually move from London to somewhere in North America? No. <laughs> That's just not happening. That's the point. In the nicest way, if you were talking about moving it to... Well, London at the moment is still the, is still the centre of the Commonwealth because that's where the Queen is. And the Commonwealth is structured still around the British monarchy. Even if countries don't have the monarch as their head of state anymore, the Commonwealth is still structured a lot around the British monarchy. Can you briefly, if need be, explain the cluster of frigate classes the RN made around the Leanders? Why so many different classes? What purpose? Uh, you have a limited number, uh, you have a hull, a sandized hull, and you are trying to make it fit the different roles, and basically it's one hull, many roles. And there's only so much you can put in that hole, so you go, right then, well, I'll make this ship do this, and this ship do this, and this ship do that. Vision, warships today have small arms in battle and part of boarding actions. I think the current USN and RN work in the Middle East, or the first episode of BBC's warship in the 1970s. 
Bottom line, is a diplomatic vessel a ship or a craft? It depends on its size. There are always ships. If they're big enough, basically, um, a craft or boat can go on a ship, but a ship can't fit on a boat. But there again, if you consider port floating, dry docks, and all those things, all ships technically can fit on them. So, um, it, you know, it's, it, it becomes an interesting thing. G.D. Hunt, with Lord Charles Barris of Verta coming up, and around, those two volume memoirs can be found on, and free on Google Books. And just how many bulldogs did Lord Charles distribute throughout the fleet? A lot. Uh, I've never been quite sure of being able to pick down how many, because some of them move ship. And so then you think, oh, well, is this a new one, or is this, a, is this another one before? Because, again, some of them get, their names seem to change. Vision, the USN and US Coast Guard boarding ships, uh, board ships all the time, judging from the news stories photos. All part of sea control. Yep. What is this ship located specifically? Uh, it's, it's located in... It's the right. It ended up going with the. Um, let's check. Yeah, it's Malaysia. And what was Malaysia? It's their flagship. It's their retired flagship, which is now a floating museum ship. Vision, any relation to Arthur C. Clarke? Uh, my dad used to say we had a relation, but I'm not sure about that. My dad claimed a lot of relations to a lot of Clarks. Um, I'm sorry, I enjoyed Dr. Clark just as much as their accent. Both are very good at what they do. Thank you, that's a very big compliment. Me, anyway. I'm not sure if it is for uh, Drac, but it's a very big compliment for me. I'm not sure, why Collingwood? Um, I like the stuff he does after Nelson dies, and I think he doesn't get enough of press for it. Hang on, well, well, there is a Clark Adam floating crane uh, on the Danube, named after a Scottish engineer, Adam Clark. That screams for a selfie, and I admit it. Yes, it does. Prince Albert, see. Do you still prefer to use BCAD? Um, as a rule, I was brought up in that era, and that I, I still sometimes do uh, do slip into BCAD uh, uh, before Christ and a dynamo after the, after the Christ uh, but I do understand why we now have BCE and CE I before common era common era but honestly it seems to me it, it, it seems to me if you're going to reset it then you have to reset it back to the beginning and that's the trouble is no one knows when the beginning was. Because otherwise you're just making a change for point. You're just making a change for change's sake. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that does sound like how that conversation would happen between Elizabeth and King George II. Yes. Anyway, so King George VI was king under his wife. No, he was a very good king and a very nice man, but he was also a very brave man. His wife was would always support him, but she was also slightly more practical and would have made sure that her husband lived because she wouldn't want him to die a martyr. Was it just World War One as to why 162 Clemson class destroyers are planned? Yes, because basically Congress don't fund the Navy until they suddenly go, we need to fund the Navy, and then they go, buy everything! So anyway, I imagine Prince Philip is also being in the same camp as his father-in-law, quite potentially, but at that point, of course, he wasn't his father-in-law. So, you know. Daniel Politics, one one. Come World War Three, the plan was for the Queen to go to the Royal Yacht. She was aware and presuming willing to do so. No, she was aware of the plan. <laughs> Whether she was willing to do so or not is a completely different matter. <laughs> 
<laughs> there is one thing. I acknowledge your plan for what to do with me. <laughs> Whether I actually do it or not is going to be a completely different matter. Grandma and Doc, they met the Hampshire not long ago, and the damage is consistent mind. Yeah, that's what I thought. What is the ship on the screen? The ship on the screen was HMS Mermaid when it was in the Royal Navy Service. Originally started out as a flagship design for the Garnham Navy. It was going to be HMS Black Saw. Another book book? Yes, but, well, I did the other book book. Rise of the Aircraft Carrier. And I've got another one after that. Uh, Cody85, is there a point at which a ship can be too generalised? Uh, not really, but at a certain point you are making a very big ship. And then it's sort of a case of, well, how much money are you paying for it to be one of the first class and everything? Okay, slightly funny. I'm sitting at Tim Hortons. Keep trying to let people know they can go, can't go in, but no one is paying attention. <laughs> oh, well. Good luck, Stafford. You're going home. Second sons in general make unpredictable kings and often do have issues. I think they never trained for it as such. Mm hmm. As I see, how impactful was losing Kitchener to British War Effort in World War I? Uh, it was helpful in some ways, because he wasn't exactly that brilliant. But in other ways, it was problematic because he'd been the focus of so much um, propaganda. George, computer activated, emer activate emergency engineering hologram. <laughs> That'd be fun. That room, a holographic drug appears. <laughs> that would be a scary engineer to have on the ship. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dragonavel. I am the emergency emergency engineering hologram. I am here to help. You're carrying a gun. No, you're carrying a sword, not a spanner. I said I was going to fix the problem. I never said the problem was in the engines. <sighs> Anuk, did you answer my questions about my USN versus RN destroyers and gun mounts? I was tired after shoveling your snow yesterday and fell asleep for the better. Uh, I'm not. There was a question which was just a list of destroyers, and I was asking what it was about, but it was just a list of destroyers. Hello, Jess P. Must go watch the Chiefs that beat the Bengals. You're coming on 78. Will you have a, ce a celebration for 100? Oh. Knowing us, we will, though. Poor Bill Trumps. Feral line. Regarding the shared gun system between land and sea forces, the M777 film modified focus system and gun and military system the US military branch used on the DGG-1000. Cough, cruelly, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my hologram question meant I, I was meant more like making holograms outside the ships, like using one to project the carib group. Ooh, well, if you could do that, and remember, it's more than just sort of it's falling electronic sensors. But if you could do it, if you could project a Carabao group from one ship, then you could cause someone a nightmare because they wouldn't know where your fleet was unless they got close enough to use radar. You'd have to be able to do it in such a way that would spoof the radar as well, at least make sure there's enough radar returns coming from the area. So you'd some sort of probably you would end up using a flotilla of drone ships to do it. Ali Akers. Come on, uh, Anuk. The 538 versus the 4.5? Yes. One half, uh, half a dozen, one and six and another. The notion that the 5 inch is a tad better for longer range than the 6 planned. RN plan BB guns uh, are from, but North Atlantic are specific. Yeah, and the RN's 4.5s allow slightly higher, because it's a twin mounting system and is designed around being a twin mounting system, is a slightly higher rate of fire for closer engagements. So it's just, it's, you know, there's balls and against of both designs. 
I say around, isn't having two Western superpowers bad news for the Soviets? It's certainly painful for the Soviets economically because they have to find even more money to build deal their opponents. But um, yeah. Sometimes there is. What if there is no moratorium on construction of battle cruisers? It's just a fifty thousand ton limit during the various treaties. Whereas everything else stays the same. How did the BCs turn out? Oh, good God! <laughs> um, expect the Royal Navy to be churning out battle cruisers every freaking year. They'll be churning out at least one a year for the whole the next twenty years. As test bed for all the ideas for battleships. Because they'll just test the con the layout and everything, and then when it comes to building King George's Fifth, it'll just be latest battle cruiser design with armor chugged in. That will literally be it. There's a fox. It's always seemed to me that Neville Chamberlain gets a lot on an military stick. What's your opinion on him in his attempt to give the Allies time to rearm, with and without hindsight? Both with and without hindsight, he's doing his best. He is an imperfect man in an imperfect world trying his best. And it's not good enough. If it had been a period of peace, he would have probably gone down in history and where he hadn't had these things as another unremarkable but not that bad prime minister. No one would have had any problem with him. No one thought him bad, no one thought him good, he'd have just been a Prime Minister. But as it was, he was given a task which he wasn't up to. Back in a second, just another weird noise. I think it might be. Is it a fluffy research assistant? Or is it... Well, let's put it this way. Is it a Corgi-based fluffy research assistant? Or a Foxy-based one, one, considering what's just run past my window? That's a very heavy foxy. I think I've figured out how the fox is getting into the spot they're getting into. I think I've figured it out, he says. Judging by what I just spotted. Foxy was very happy with the other things they found out there today. All right. After what Senate King, after what the colonies stay loyal to Britain, as in no rebellions, no independence movements, how does this change the Cold War? Uh, America has a panic attack because instead of the empire breaking up, which America thought would be better, uh, the America the empire would still be going on and probably would form into some version of a Commonwealth. In that, whilst independence and movements and rebellions might not happen, but the British still wouldn't want to minister them from the UK. So you probably end up with a Commonwealth that looks somewhere like the Euro somewhat like sort of the European Union, in that it would become a global trade, uh, sort of a U U uh, EU NATO hybrid, global trade, defence, sort of political alliance, which would probably dominate the United Nations, considering the now a number of national votes it would have. It would be voting as a bloc en masse on the UN.
I said, how many Soviet submarine classes were there? Oh, <laughs> so many. Uh, right, now, where's my Norman Palmer book? This is the question. If you want to know how many of the Russian submarine classes are, I need a Norman Palmer book. Which was also something I was considering today for putting on this discussion. Uh, right. Norman, where are you? Not up there, are you? I don't have the Soviet section up there anymore. I moved it. Uh, there's Destroyers of World War II by Whitley. We were talking about that earlier, the Elbing class. So we'll get that down and discuss it in a second. Gotta be. Norman! <laughs> are you right in. Oh, you are, aren't you? That's going to be a building job to get to you. But luckily, I have the other version, don't I? And the big red one. Mm -hmm. ah. oh. There we go. There we go. How many Soviet submarines do you say? All right, all right, all right. So. We'll do Soviet submarines question, and I'll put that in as one of the sections. So, the Naval Institute Guide to the Soviet Navy, 5th edition, Norman Palmer. I also have the another edition, which is sitting in there and it's slightly more difficult to get to position. Um, submarine support ships, they have a few, but let's look for the submarines. Do -do 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 -do. Seriously, this book is far, far too massive sometimes, I think. Uh, right then, I want submarines, I don't want KGB aircraft, I don't want maritime border troops, I want submarines, which is page 91. Open up straight to 69. That's not good. Well, that is good, but it's not good for me at this particular time. Right then. Submarines. This is taken in early 1990. They have two, four, six, seven classes of SBN, well, eight classes of SBN, SSBN, including the Hotel Freeze. Uh, the SS, one class of SSBEs, uh, two, uh, ooh, four classes of SSGN, five classes, well, six classes, seven classes of SSN, oh, three more classes of SSGN, so that's eight classes of SSGN, and three more classes of SSN, so that's nine classes of SSN, and diesels, they have, so total of two, four, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 41, 41 classes submarines, and a total of 310 subs spread across those 41 classes. Norm Palmer. I did mention the Albin class of Torpedo, so let's see. This is M.G. Whitley's Destroyers of World War II. And this is actually where most of the stuff comes from when people are talking about these things. And it's quite good. I can show you what it has in here about uh, about the Albin class. Sotom Torpedo Bot.
Alright, so, basically everything you can find in here on the Eldings is on, fits on this one page. And... Design. A slight modification on this Type 35 design. Which are also Eldings. Hmm. And... Yeah. And they're on this page. These two pages. So you've got three pages on albums. Uh, 36 and 37. 39s... Uh, once you get into them and type 41s and 42, 40s... 41s... Full and torpedo, but... Yeah. How do I put it? They're a, They're an interesting design. They're not really a destroyer. They're really what do I describe them as? The Elming class are the direct descendants of the torpedo boats that had been ocean-going torpedo ships that the destroyers have been designed to fight. So basically, it's the German Navy, instead of having destroyers, which have torpedoes and can do that, and then torpedo boats, like the Royal Navy does have, they have torpedo boats, mm, torpedo ships, and then destroyers, which are the ships designed to, dis to destroy those. It, it, basically, it's a torpedo focus, which makes sense if you're the German Navy at that point, because... Again, it's fighting in the uh, in the Baltic. It makes sense for the Baltic. It's one of those things. You need the firepower in the Baltic. You need the numbers, but you don't want big ships. Was that a Hellcat on the front cover of the carrier book? Yeah, it's an F-63F Hellcat um, crashing onto USS Enterprise. And I'd argue it's a very... Uh, you see, I have a theory as to why it's the way it is in this book, and why I uh, why I um, um, find it, because it's, it's very much from... As I said, there are lots of sections which are from the very traditional American perspective. As in... And this is the sort of series when, when you're looking at it through history, you're going, well, the U.S. Navy builds up these huge carriers and the carrier battles from the U.S. are massive. And, you know, it's carrier versus carrier warfare. And it's, it's far more famous. And far... the accepted idea is the Americans get the American way is the right way of carrier warfare. Whereas, as I would say, the American way of, carrier, way of carrier warfare is the right way for them and suits their strategic situation, which is fine. And not just fine. It's excellent. It's what you should do because it fits their strategic situation. But the British carrier system is also fine because that fits their strategic situation, which is different. <laughs> Let's be honest. The American and British are not facing the same war. They're not facing the same kind, uh, the same battles, the same issues. They're not going to build. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not facing. So the ships and the, their doctrine they're going to is not going to be the same. It's going to be by its nature have to be different to accommodate those differences. And there's nothing wrong with that. The idea that one size fits all is always so annoying. Because it's so bland. Customers, only 15 or 20 years ago? Well, up to, uh, after the 15 or 20 years ago, they started developing it a bit.
After being 228, I've never really heard anyone talk about USS Anders Pennsylvania and Tennessee class armor cruisers. I'm curious to know what your opinion of them is. I'm going to retain that with, with, with quiet because there might be a special coming up on them in the year of the cruiser. So there might be something. I, there is something I'm considering doing a special on armored cruisers and doing a bit of comparison, compare and contrast. Because, of course, I'm doing the Duke of Edinburgh class, which I love. I have a great affection for the Duke of Edinburgh class. I think they're not next week. I think they're the week after next day they come out. Uh, I've got to record them. And next week's actually Cruiser 1. But they're lovely. And I like armored cruisers. I think they get a bad rep because of the Battle of Coronel and some of the other issues. But the thing is, they're sort of left for a few years while everyone's developing battle cruisers. And by the time they're looking to get them, start building new ones, the Washington Naval Treaty happens. And that's where I think they get their rep from. So I'm really interested, when turning, ships lean out and boats lean in. Mm -hmm. Why do so little of the World War II soldier ships have their names moved on? Uh, <laughs> that's the Soviet Navy. Uh, Daniel's politics one. I get numbering all years based on Christian isn't really on, but I don't see how renaming system of doing that fixes that because you're still doing the same numbering. I know it's the, it's it's the joy of the world. This is what I'm How bad was the coalition condition of destroyers and destroyers are based against Germany? I've seen HMS Campbelltown be described as an escort, but not even 1940RN could use, not, not used. Um, not really that bad. They were useful, but they had to be upgraded. They were hulls, and it's far quicker to refit and upgrade existing hulls than build new ones, because you could do that in a fitting out dock to make them viable against submarines. And that was their purpose, really, to, deal with, uh, to be used for submarines. And used to buy time in terms of hull numbers until your surge of actual construction came through. Knight Sigrun, I have both Drak and Doc on. Oh, you poor boy. Well, I'm presuming boy, but considering Knight 60831 after I'm talk to you for a year. But, um,. Yeah, uh, that, that that's that that's just gonna you know that's 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 the ear stuff. Um, Baratrowski, hello, Drac. What did you do to the ship? Yeah, that would be, that would be strongly coming through. Senator, um, how would the pirate kid react to the USS kid, Bert Class, showing up flying his flag? He'd be very proud. <laughs> But going on, what is the currently the best naval main gun? They're all terrible. No, they don't take that the wrong way. No, they're, they're they're. How do I put this politely? They're all very refined, and they've all been in use for years. So they all work much more muchness. But the thing is, they're all equally meh. In that, you sit there and go, well, yes, we all know we need a main gun, so we're just fitting one on. We're fitting the same one on we've been fitting for years, and no one's really thinking about what should we actually be fitting on something which is this freaking size. It's kind of like the phalanx, only bigger.
That home, Holodrak, I am now going to vent the atmosphere of the ship to start getting rid of the problem. Then I will begin fixing the damage to the ship. Hmm. Mm. Hello, wasting 40 Allied divisions on Czechoslovakia and the same time shifting armament of those 40 divisions to Germany was not really doing Chamberlain's best. Uh, honestly, Chamberlain just didn't understand the value of Czechoslovakia. Because honestly, if you're going to, if you are going to draw a line anywhere, you shouldn't have drawn it in Poland. You should have drawn it in Czechoslovakia. Because Czechoslovakia, you can actually reinforce and get to. That's the thing. You can actually get to Czechoslovakia. You can't get to Poland. You can only get to Poland if you go through Denmark and the uh, 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 and into the Baltic. Etc., which is going to cause Denmark trouble, and you know, Denmark really don't want that. Whereas to get to Czechoslovakia, you can do that, you can get to Czechoslovakia by getting to Greece and or going to to an extent. Italy is pro would probably be neutral on that one, but Italy's also not keen on Germany getting into Czechoslovakia at that point, and you know, because remember, the fascist powers weren't exactly as friendly. Each other as we like to imagine from history. They are best friend frenemies. <sighs> More than modern friends. Clan Cameron, battle cruisers with convenient slots spots to slot in armor that is remarkably found in warehouses, like with the town with the towns or the counties? Yes, that possibly would happen as well, knowing the British. And a lot of water for armor as well. Then, from <coughs> my assessment, the chairman has been changed after reading a book on the a book of the early years of war and building up the early war uh, to the early war period. <coughs> oh yeah, but I said I would agree he was arrogant and not particularly nice. But there again, he's not a particularly bad PM as the as the things go. He's just not. Don't take this the wrong way, but. There is no such thing as a perfect human to have put, uh, put in power. Everyone who gets to the top has to make compromises to do so. Now, the compromises you have to make are either with the electorate or with powerful people who will support you and persuade the electorate that you are the right person. That's your choice. I would argue some recent, we have seen some recent examples of people who don't compromise their views with the electorate, and so don't appeal to enough of them to actually get elected. And don't try, don't of course compromise with the power, the people in power as well to get to the uh, get to power. And sometimes you see people who try to compromise with both, and they tend to come a cropper as well. You have to pick which one you're going to compromise with. And you can always tell when someone's compromised with one rather than the other. If someone's compromised with the pu uh, with the public rather than the powerful, you tend to start seeing a lot of what in these days we call a strong media campaign against them, a lot of leaking. If someone campaigns with uh, uh, compromises with the powerful but not with the public you see that you you get a lot of strong messaging, but they don't seem to be ever gain popular support. They never seem to have the numbers that they should have in terms of percentages. If someone tries to compromise with both, well, you can fool all the people, most of the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time. So an Imperial Federation, that's a grand, yeah, for that sort of Commonwealth scenario, yes.
Gahon, uh, would you agree with my opinion that sending British troops and tanks to Estonia without air defences, etc., is, um, is a way to nothing good? I'd say it's, um... Camera vibrating. Um, sending Britain, nothing good. It's not really sensible. I would have preferred to have based some... Well, the trouble is you can't really... If you want to... You don't want to base air defence in Estonia. And the trouble is you really... Uh, Norway isn't close enough unless you can overfly Sweden. So that's the thing. You really need Sweden to join the uh, NATO because then you could base some fighters there to actually cover the Baltic. Come on, one of the uh, PRP Honeycut books on the uh, for an Amazon is for twenty pound two pounds. Should I buy it? Hmm, it's not bad. Twenty two pounds a man. Cam is vibrating. Sorry, I didn't realize that. I'm not sure how the camera is vibrating. It's not vibrating at the moment. I think not as far as I can see. It shouldn't have vibrated at all. Hmm. Sorry, uh, I've just realised that when I vibrate, the whole thing vibrates. And it's sitting on the monitor, and the monitor, so, um, yeah, okay, I won't cough. I didn't realise I could make the whole thing vibrate. Mm-hmm. Um, Nigerian. The Soviets seem to have invested so much in their submarine force that they didn't. That they did. That did they neglect their service force to an extent? Yes, but it also made sense. Duckling ninety five. Well, when I say it, it makes sense. The Soviets developed powerful surface action groups. Especially, uh, the Sovervov started off as surface raiders. Once you got nuclear submarines, you can use your nuclear submarines as uh, in sort of surface raiders to do the long range strikes. And try and type full resources as well as in issuing uh, interfering with any transatlantic resupply. And the major surface action groups are combined with your SSKs to try and stop Allied naval forces closing on Soviet critical areas. Local 95, how is it back in the 20th century we could churn out ships, yet today it takes years to build them, not Type 26? We're building very, very slowly, and it's a far more complicated ship. It used to take roughly two... Let's be honest, ships of roughly 10,000 tons usually take roughly two years to build. That's throughout history. Let's talk, so what was the effect on the internal canals and waterways on the UK war economy, and do you know how... Uh, how do you know any books that would cover this uh, this on the ground scale? There's none that cover it on the ground scale, but I've done a video about it somewhere. A couple of videos, which had some books and sources listed in them. If you search. Uh... Right, so obviously, uh, so, and then the Elvings are German ships that actually make sense for needs. Not too big, not too unusual. Uh, I would have preferred them to have slightly better guns, but yeah, they make sort of sense for the needs. That's sure. Plus, there is not actually an average human. Yeah, that has been a cause of many issues. Right, so let's see. What are the rising middle-sized navies that you watch out the most today? Um, hmm. Rising middle-sized middle, middle -sized navies? There aren't many of those. As in rising middle-sized navies. Most of them are already established. I, I tend to pay a lot of attention to the Indian Navy, and I like to see some of the stuff they come with, because they're quite innovative. And 
I wish certain other navies would get more investment because I think they could be very innovative. Uh, I think the Australians could be a lot more innovative and I think the Japanese are kind of interesting, but I watch the Koreans as well. I would always keep an eye on the Koreans because they're one of those nations which can, when they decide to actually go for naval warfare, produce good stuff. And then they tend to get distracted and stop doing it. But they can produce good stuff. <laughs> yes, there's a little bit of your wacky ideas I've featured into this year's choice of topic. How would you design a 6,500 standard tons displacement heavy cruiser with a hybrid oil coal plant in 1943? Ship is for China and must, uh, must have aviation. 6,000 nautical miles range. At least 40% of the fuel must be coal. Ouch. Well... Honestly, I'm going to take two well, I, I i six and a half thousand tons for that sort of range and that that sort of three i'm probably going for two triple eight inch gun turrets and put them forward and do some something something that looks like a mini nelson a, a mini nelson and rodney or dunkirk class something like that is probably where i have to go because once you're at six and a half thousand tons, there's a very limitation on what you can do, even though heavy cruiser. And having less than the six eight inch guns is not really an option. And three twin turrets, well then you have to have another ammunition storage and space all at the back. So you you end up with two trebles forward. Hmm. Vision. After your last live, I took a look. I took a look at the clothes on the Hunter's Point base. Thought it's a shame the USN couldn't reopen the shipyard for repairs and refits, restore, restoring two or so of its great love the Grovenox. It would be good. As sure, they possibly should have drawn the line at rural Angeles. There wasn't really the political support to do that. I would have liked them to do it. That would make most sense. But that's going to be difficult to balance the French and the British on it. But by the time you get to Czechoslovakia, there is actually support. If they stopped Anschluss, that would have been kind of interesting. Ruhr would have crushed Hitler early on. Then it's, what ships would you procure for the Chinese name in the 1930s to prepare them for the confrontation with Japan? You may be sneaky with Italy and France for capital unit production. Ooh. Submarines. Probably Italian submarines. And a lot of them. I'd make it a nightmare for anyone to get close to China. Destroyers and torpedo boats as well. And basically it would be a flotilla defense system. So there'd be an outer ring of submarines. And there would be... Then it would be the destroyer flotillas and then the torpedo boat flotillas. And I'd have to have a lot of aviation to try and cover them. And if I'm going to build those heavy cruisers, six and a half thousand ton heavy cruisers, then yeah, I'd have a few of those as flagships. But the whole purpose would be to avoid actually having to to make the to bleed the Japanese heavy units long before they reach my heavy units. So, so I was asking. So we have a kind of stagnation when it comes to artillery system and fitted ships. Yes. Oh, re Soviets in replicated technology are both less cruel to their population, but also 
more resilient to Cold Wars. Well, the thing is, if the British had the replicator technology, then I doubt the Russians will develop it that quickly. They'll get it, but it'll take them a while to develop it. Panamerica, on a subject of large destroyers, what do you think of the country? It's county class DDG. It's about the size of a town class cruiser. I quite like the counties. I like them. And there was a toss up. You see, it, depending on uh, one of the interesting things was this one, this book, it ends in 1950 ish, 50 50 ish. And honestly, if I I was tempted to put it to 1960 and include the counties. But there's an, there was COVID and there was all sorts of issues. And I had to cut out, especially as because I had to cut out and I was using the tribals as the way to link it through. Because I had to cut out the RCN and the RAN, RAN, the RAN and the Canadian, the Australian Canadian tribals and their bearings, etc. I couldn't include the counties because it just didn't make sense anymore. So it could have been had the counties as well, and it would have had the RAN and the RCN, and it probably would have been an extra thirty-five thousand words on top of it. If not a bit longer, uh, maybe a bit more. But there is there is limitations to what you can do. And I would have to go back to publishers and go, can I have a bigger book? Nice to go on. So if the British Empire had su uh, survived, it would have uh, had more political influence in the USA. Was there more than that in why the USA wanted it broken up? Who knows? That would be very underhand for the USA to want them to break it up just because of that, wouldn't it? Because we're allies. Then it comes, what would space combat look like if you wrote a space military series? Just looking for initial ideas. Not that they're having build troubles so you could do in in-depth would be interesting. It all depends on the propulsion system you have. If you have a propulsion system which is warp-based, then you can go in and out of system as you wish, wherever you wish, sort of thing, something like that. If it's, let's say, slipstream based, then you pop out at certain points and then go in at certain points, then you have a very different system of defense. Uh, in the latter one, I would certainly have far more mine lane capabilities because I'd mine them, literally. I would have space stations near those points with a whole load of missiles, and I would have minefields, which I would turn on and off, depending on whether the ship sent the right code. And if it sent the wrong code, boom! And it doesn't even matter. This is the thing. People often forget their fingers space. They go, but what happens if the mines don't destroy the ship? It doesn't matter. They're going to do enough damage to the ship and blind its centers enough that you can get you can blast it with other things. That's the point. It's a mission kill if it's not a kill. But yeah, most of uh, the space sci-fi books don't tend to go into much mind warfare. Can vibrating as if hot air flows before it. Let's see if that's better. Uh, I'm not sure. Or like it's having buffering issues. Well, according to me, it's got not 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 got any drop frames. I have no idea what's going on. Because I'm looking at the screen, this one, and I'm looking at that screen, and it's fine. And it, the only worry it thinks worry about is the audio stream. As usual, it's worried about the audio stream. The only thing it doesn't worry about the audio stream is when I'm singing. When I'm singing, it's fine. It doesn't worry about the audio stream. When I when I'm not singing, it does worry.
Right on, Dorothy, the whole world is in your hands. What do you do next? Build the Space Navy. Conquer Mars. Um, oh, if I was ra running the world, we'd have a... There'd be a massive infrastructure building program. That'd be the first thing. Massive infrastructure construction and standardization programs. Uh, first, get the infrastructure sorted out, the telecommunications sorted out, and the power network sorted out. Try and make it more sustainable, mainly because the thing is, if you can make it more sustainable and renewable, you can bring down the cost. Because you can just go boom. And. Yeah, at that point, then it start working on exploring space. And also. <sighs> you see, the thing is. I would probably go for if I was running the whole world a national health insurance scheme where everyone paid in to the amount that they were able to. And it was literally run like a health insurance scheme. So everyone pays in. And it's run by the, the World Bank, let's say, so that would be set up uh, so that it would be the national bank for my world or a government. And, uh, yeah. So have a national health insurance scheme. So and basically have it sort of you know, no one ha doesn't have coverage if they have any medical care. And education would be free. There would be free uh, option of free education, or you could choose to pay for private if you wanted. But there would be free education for all to bachelor level at university or apprentice level, and I would include apprentice schemes as part of it. Because, frankly, I think education, infrastructure, and health, if you fix those things, you can, uh, you would probably end up with a world which would be far happier and everything else would sort itself out. The infrastructure allows everyone to go where they need to go and all the stuff to get to where it needs to get to. And education allows people to open up the world to them. And do what they need to do, do what they want to do, and health gives them security to it. If you don't have to worry about, if you know your health care is going to be looked after, it gives you a lot more freedom. <clears throat> this is Roxo. The British keep Heligoland, despite the Kingdom of Hanover breaking away under Queen Victoria. What effect does the island have on either world war? Uh, World War One, it annoys the German Navy somewhat massively. They either have to do an amphibious operation to try and get it back, or uh, to try and get it, or they get blasted. And then, if it's been defended in World War One, and if the, the Royal Navy managed to keep it in World War Two, it's going to get bombed like anything from above. But again, it's going to be a big problem for the Germans. The Royal Navy probably went up having to resupply it by submarine. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. C, what do you think so far of Radikin as the new CDS? Seems to be doing okay, from what I've heard. Kind of goes with the Elbings. The Italian class is kind of about being the speakers? Mm, 20%, yeah. Dr. C, if anyone built World War II to type destroyers today, but with modern bits, what would they be classed as? Corvettes. That'd be so tiny. Maybe OPVs, <laughs> but Corvettes probably. Um, nice to get everyone. I, you're basically talking about the US Navy having somewhere in the region of. Well, I would say somewhere in the region of a nearly 900, possibly as many as a thousand destroyers. Yeah. The 
the Japanese Navy would not be happy in that scenario. But guys, you know, watch the show where a shipyard worker in Newport needed a shipyard so they could build the US supercarriers faster, but they take six years to build so they can keep all the shipyard workers busy. True, because they want to keep the yard open, but they don't want to build uh, and, and maintain the ships uh, and have the capacity to build more, but they don't want to build them faster because then they have to either have accept gaps in construction, which could cause them to lose workforce, or could, you know, or, or, or they'd have to have actually more in service. That's a job. This is the point that drives me crazy. a posse. No king pre the 1600s believed in a divine right to rule. The phrase was by the grace of God, king. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Notable. What do you think of the argument that people thought Germany had a point saying they annexing German lands? Woke up after the Czech Republic. Heard this on Model 2 TV. It's a point to make. It's an argument. But it's an argument mainly made from the point of view of people who are going, We don't want another world war. No one else does either, so don't make us. Doctor C, if you could Q-snap your dream ship for the RN right now, what would it be? <laughs> it's just an individual ship or an entire class? Uh, if it's an individual ship... That's probably a brand new LHD. Um, if it's an entire class... It's mine and Drax designed for the Type 83s, and the Royal Navy's getting nine of them. Uh, <coughs> if it's an entire fleet, I expect some very interesting variations on those LHDs, Type 83s, some RFAs, and uh, Queen Elizabeth class getting a um, HMS Ark Royal and HMS... What I want the other one to be... Mm -hmm. HMS Ark Royal and HMS Illustrious. No, you HMS Unicorn. I'll go for Unicorn. Um as a new as another pair of carriers, which will be just slightly bigger. Because I will also, as while I'm fixing the entire fleet, also expand all the uh, graving docks and make sure they're all worked and build a new uh, put in a new graving dock in in uh Portsmouth as well, which can take ships which are uh, Let's say up to four. Let's say we make them all four hundred meters long, and the new Queen Elizabeth will be like three hundred fifty meters long. Well, the new Ark Royals variant, not the Queen Elizabeth, will be three hundred fifty meters long. Junior, so is that a hint about what a future book might include? A future book might include a lot of stuff. See, how would Poland, Dutch, USN have done if they had tribals? Well, it depends how they build the tribals and what they build them. If they build their, their equivalents of tribals, so let's say the USN had built a tribal design but with twin 5 inch guns. So they'd gone for twin 5 inch 38s on those positions. Then they could have been very, very useful, interesting ships. But would they have fitted the? They wouldn't have fitted the USN style of operations. That's the thing. The tribals fit the Royal Navy style of operations, and they fit what the Royal Navy wants them to do. But you wouldn't build a tribal for the Polish Navy or for the Dutch Navy or for the USN Navy. You build their equivalent con of that concept, which would be something different. Could still be. Would still be cool. Bidrin, be nice to see you cover RN, RAN, Tribals, and Darings at the County Class Destroyers in a USNI Proceedings article or two. Could be interesting. I have a the special copy on my truck, but I left a copy I brought out for people to see while walking through the house. It helps you get some types of this. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. That's the short, the SN9 way of dealing with the Dominion. Hmm. If 
law. Uh, just caught up the questions, let's see. Oh, almost caught up the questions. Dr. Uh, Frank Santosi, what if they use the older code that still the checks out? Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, if an older code that still checks out, then they <coughs> have a holding area and send something to investigate. You're allowed through the first layer of mines. You will then sit because you will not be allowed through the second layer of mines. And and then another ship is, and there is an investig a ship ready coming to investigate you. And then it will be coming closer. And we'll have a boarding party aboard aboard. And literally it'll be a small ship and it'll be a sort of phase that's going through deactivation and reactivation of the minefield. As you'll notice, literally bouncing up and down as you're walking around. Ah, sorry. I should put it on a stabilized mount. Vision, when you have the to watch enough, uh, watch the Nashville's Expanse, which I haven't watched there, nothing of the end, uh, a good debate is on whether, whether the MCR and Donna J is a battleship or a battlecruiser. She's bigger than this warship, but is used in the cruiser role on TV. Hmm, interesting. So, from what you said earlier, the British Imperial Federation would make the USA a second-rate power, pretty much. No, they'd still be a first-rate power. They just would have to work with the British as an equal, rather than a dominant. It wouldn't be the American age. It would be the English-speaking age. Or the Anglo-American age. <coughs> mm -hmm. Vision, you have my socialist vote. Mm. That said, the, the the thing is, the style of conservatism I belong to is the old uh, is the oldest style of conservatism, and the idea was, you do, uh, the, uh, the conservative itself is a very reactionary is a reaction to the development of liberalism, and basically it was a case of liberalism is fine. It's a lovely thing to have an ideology and a philosophy. but you don't want an ideology and philosophy running a country. They have to look at the facts and the evidence. And it's if they can make it, if the ideology and the philosophy can make a case that is the best evidentially based case for it, then you use their idea. If they can't, then you don't. And the whole thing was that you were supposed to govern with responsibility and with reference, uh, you know, with reference and research, and and make the right way decision, not be motivated by your own ideology and personal views. As sort of that sort of thing, which is in itself to an extent an ideology, but it's an anti-ideology ideology which espouses not how you're not making decisions through ideology. The trouble is, modern conservatism has all these phrases now put in. You know, there's small small government conservative and all this stuff, and you sit there and go, but the thing is, you need the right size government for the situation. Small government isn't always the answer. It wasn't small governments which fought World War II. Because when you're having to mass mobilize for a massive war or effort like that, you can't get away with small government. You can't. It's not going to work. So that's not a problem, though. And there are times, though, when you can deal with a smaller government. And there are some scenarios where you want the government hands off. I stop. <coughs> the video tomorrow is going to be a classic example of me sitting there going, there are good reasons to privatize industries. There are also sometimes when you sit there and go, uh, we have set up a monopoly which has one customer, which is the British taxpayer. So we, by privatization, all we are doing is this, which doesn't really help. It would have been better to find the money up front ourselves and invest it rather than do it this way. Because it would have actually been cheaper.
And but that's the trouble. Everyone's in their freaking ideologies these days. No one is actually governing. Well, you know, leading. Mm. Bad guy in Sydney. Do you think the USA would have had been better off if the Alaska and Guam replaced the two North Carolinas in 1942? Yes. It would have certainly had an interesting time. <coughs> oh, sorry. Pardon me. <coughs> I'm not sure why I suddenly started coughing. <coughs> Pardon me, bodies. I think something's gone down the wrong tube. Um, hello, Jeffrey Plum. You're near the USS M Salem. Cool. Mm hmm. As the trouble. I know that by grace of God and divine right read very similar, but they are subtly different. That's the important point. They are. Do you enjoy my work? Thank you, Jeffrey Plum. That's very kind of you to say. Uh, that's the thing with the British Constitution, and that was the problem for the Stuarts when they came down to England. They found that the Constitution in England was different than Scotland. They thought it would be the same, and it was very different, and it was a very different political scenario. And James the first could do it, Charles the first couldn't. And Charles the second could do it, but James the second couldn't in terms of managing it. Seneca so, uh, Nero, with another King George on the horizon, 50 or 60 years, will the successor name a ship at King George, uh, George the seventh or Royal George? I'm not possibly. But also remember, Charles has already announced that if he becomes king, he will be King George. Because uh, he doesn't think King Charles III is a good idea. Because number one, got his head cut off. Number two, was known for basically going after anything with a pulse, and that was probably female. Um, you know. Grant Sam Thompson. Near the funnel that one, 400 meter. I, I wasn't sure about 375 meter one for my HLD or 340. So would your ship be 410 meters? They're no longer. I'd have to make sure the, uh, well, let's see. My, um, honestly, the aircraft carriers don't need to be that long. And you also, the other thing with the LHDs. So I'd build my, um, my aircraft carriers would be 350 meters maximum. Because that fits, it, it, and it's unless you want to start going nuclear powered CVN, 350 meters is more than enough. And that's adding about 25% onto the length of the current Queen Elizabeth class. But, you know, gives them a very nice, uh, very nice long. Um, but the thing is, <laughs> LHDs have to get closer than the shore, and sometimes they have to get really close in the shore. So you have to think about what you want to maneuver inside a fjord. Uh, Frank's not to see. Uh, okay, if you're British. Okay, okay. The tribal stand guard in Guadalcanal. What gets through? <laughs> Nothing while there's still one of them afloat. Uh, Colin Cameron. For a question, Snap, it would have been uh, some sort of automatic construction ship. A Q-Snap. It would have been some sort of automatic construction ship that you feed with raw materials and anything you want and has designed for future action in the databanks. Ooh, that would be a good idea. That's for sure. Or a city ship. I could get Atlantis but an improved version of Atlantis from Stargate with huge shipyards. Oh, I could have fun with that. Because that was always the thing that bothered me about Atlantis. You know, you're building a city ship, but it hasn't got any shipyards on it. It would be the first thing I would think about. If I'm going to trouble to build a city ship, it's going to have to have bays for a huge, uh, for fighters and aircraft. Uh, again, if I've got puddle jumpers, why have I not got production facilities for the city of those puddle jumpers on the city ship. 
so I can build them. And build, again, I've got a city ship. Why do I not have production facilities for the freaking main weaponry? It's, I've gone to the trouble of building a city ship. It's got a huge space. I put these in. I'd be able to produce weapons. I'd be able to produce fighters. And I should probably have a shipyard that can allow me to produce a freaking ship. Maybe not the biggest class of ship, but a decent sized one. And then imagine that series. That'd be brilliant. Build your own destroyer level ship. Well, hey, pump them out. Wraith Hive comes into view. Yeah, that's fine. Take on three flotillas of destroyers, each with five personnel on them. Bye bye. Mm hmm. That's a joke. Would giving the tribals the fight video be a downgrade on the open war uh, 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 of the in open water gunboating the tribals were built for? If you've got double five inch 38s, then yeah, they've got a slightly slower rate of fire, but they've got more pamp. So we'll see. You see, it's got to be a double gun, though. I was asking, do you say no travel clones? The Porter class and Summer class came with four dual five inch. Mm, yeah, no. There is a difference. Look at the balancing and the shaping of the hull, and I'll tell you what those ships are built for. Strafanger, hello, your book arrives. Sorry, reading Rag Sawfish, pa uh, P.T. Soundverse, and the Bloody Shambles. Hood. You, sell, you, sell, you sell a lot of other authors' books. I do. I like that. Hmm. I think if the Imperial Federation UK was a dominant European power order, how does that affect the Suez and Falklands? Uh, the Suez crisis is very, very different. Because in that sense, Egypt probably becomes part of the Commonwealth. And maybe they even make Israel part of the Commonwealth, in which case the Suez crisis might not happen. It might be very different. Astro, when do humans ever do anything that's an ideological? All the time. As I've often asked when people, I said there's no ideological position about bin collection. People just want the bins collected. And they like it done weekly because they don't like it to stink. But well, sadly, concerning US means something different. But as one US, I go by your definition. And I've been able to say that without people getting mad and thinking I'm the other. Mm. Any sense for explaining? Sadly, it seems like people just want to hear your party or ism and not the nuance. I usually just go, I'm old style conservative. And I say, look, I'm a, re uh, you know, conservatism was reaction to liberalism. Basically, the idea was you didn't use ideology when making decisions, you used the facts when you were government. And that ideology was a good thing. There was nothing wrong with having an ideology. It's just your decision in government should not be based on ideology, it should be on the facts of. This is the facts. This is what's better according to the data we have. Then, I'm going to politics and the theme of monopolies. Where does the Honourable East India Company sit? Actually, you don't need to answer that. No, no one does. Oh, God, if I was PM, there'd be problems. It's like if me and, uh, me and Drac were sort of talking on a, after Bill Trunks the other day and dividing up the jobs and Drac went, I'll have defence because if I'm given the foreign ministry, I'll be upset with people the whole time. And I'm rephrasing his phrase. Uh. Sure. Well, that's because it's easier. You don't have to think about what's the best solution, just what is the most pure ideological solution. Well, that's the trouble. Ideology doesn't help. When you're making those decisions. Hello, Tanifoka. Hello, Orange Cats. Now I'm watching the back of the heads. Well, hello to you, cats. Suspicion. Armor doesn't seem to figure much in the expanse, but still compared to the small UN, UNN versus B, uh, UN BBs, the MCR and Dodger is still more of a battle cruiser or a fast battleship. I'd say probably that if it's Alma's not much, then it's probably Battlecruiser. 
Um, okay, what two classes of US built and British built ships are most like Mob or Two? Atlantis and Dido's probably. As for other class of ships. Well, the Midways and Maltas would have been interesting if the Maltas had been built. But honestly, not that much. Senator, what is a Q ship? Graham Hunt, Doc is right. James VI could, Charles II could, as they were taught. Charles I and Charles II, uh, James the Seventh the Second couldn't. They were not taught, just like the present William and Harry. Yeah, William's been taught a lot. Hello, Andrew Macomber. Hello, Sir Shaw. Are the British really uh, British slowly working their way up to a nuclear aircraft? No. Not at the moment. Mm, life can change. Considering that the Tokra used crystals to grow tunnels, the ancients could have used their tech for ship hulls. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't. The ancient ships, as was shown, were produced in some very interesting facilities using geo um well using a basis of geothermal power etc in their shipyards there was a whole episode which had a ship uh, where they found the shipyard Paul Bessick, surely if you have arc roll you should have eagle that's what i was thinking but i prefer unicorn so if I'm naming it, it's Unicorn. Because Unicorns are pretty. Especially when they're not aircraft carriers. <laughs> right. So from Dark Clock, you are British old school conservative. American old school liberal. Some ideological bases, but different names. Yeah. I guess Argentina versus the British Imperial Federation ends in disaster for Argentina. How reasonable is it that the UK Imperial Federation could afford Catabar and Sovel carriers? The U UK Imperial Federation would have Catabar carriers. They would have Catabar carriers. The nicest way, if you're a superpower, you have Catabar carriers. Possibly the secondary powers, Canada, Australia, India, South Africa, have Stovel carriers, but... Would retired East Indian Company officers get pensions after the company got taken over by the state? Yes, because they took it over. They didn't. They had to. Uh, they had to honour the pensions and come uh, and the other issues. Dan Freeman, there was a very simple reason for that. As British comes, you said point out British compensated slave owners when slavery was abolished, but not slaves. Uh, the start of the argument was that the freedom the slaves were getting was the compensation, and also by <clears throat> pretty much by definition buying them off, uh, you basically said it's not uh, you're not going to prosecute them for what they've done in the past because you can't; it was perfectly legal. And you stop them trying to sue you, but you've also made it politically palatable. And that was sensible. It was sensible. It was economics. It was cheaper to buy them off than to have the arguments. It's real politic. Unless how you separate what goes in the bins, that can be ideological. Not really. Let's be honest. Recycling is mostly what our level of material sciences and capabilities are, and uh, the rest is rubbish and food waste. Hmm. Jack Ray, did the USSR diesel subs uh, patrol deep in the Atlantic? Some of the later ones did. 
Um, Philip, when British uh, people start talking about ideological, uh, ideologic ideology, I recall Chieftain's video on the Soviet Army Doctrine, one where he cites all the Soviet ideology uh, and has to compensate and, and, com and compensate with um, orange juice. Hmm. So, Thompson, I'm still having trouble with the frigate terminology. I know from the age of Sailect, I just prefer the prestige of cruiser. Frigate, to me, is more multi-role than a big stick. Hmm. I can understand that one. That's right. Would you have deep space carriers or big ships? Hmm. Probably carriers as well as big... Uh, most ships would... All ships would carry a certain fighter complement if I had fighter technology available that were working. But, um, yeah, I would have proper carriers as well. First of all, just see, what is your, pro uh, your opinion of the USSR e little low class? They were quite cool. They were quite cool. Sure, right. these bolts. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Stafford and Dan, for doing that stuff. So, why only Canada and not both? Why spare, spread your logistics? <coughs> yeah. Sorry, you know, uh, in the nicest way, you don't need it. If you have Catabar carriers, you don't need Stovel carriers. Catabar carriers give you far more options and get, allow you to launch a far heavier aircraft to carry out a far longer range strike. Stovel is good for LHDs. And so that means you might have LHDs with Stovel capability, but no. Carriers, if you're the major superpower, you have Catabar carriers. Right. I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone for watching. I'm sure quite a lot of people are watching Drac, and as sensibly so. And well, I haven't had lunch or tea, and I'm hungry, so I'm going to go have it. I'm going to answer the last questions, and then I'm going to go off. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you for being here. I hope you've enjoyed this evening, and thank you. So. Um, Frank, do see what are your mind layers? Ideal cloud types of space. Yes. Mm hmm. Picture change before the end. Well, let's change the picture. Let's go for do 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 this one. There you go. That's quite cute. What is setting so, here? What is catabar? Um. Catapult assisted take uh, catapult assisted takeoff barrier assisted recovery. Stubble. Short takeoff a uh, short takeoff vertical landing. Uh Vistol, vertical short takeoff and landing. Stoll, short takeoff and landing. Uh, um, the MCR in Donagy is HMS Hood with JK and N class destroyer. She carries about in a really big hangar and deploys when needed, along with a regiment of Royal Marines. Ooh, that sounds cool. Take care, George Newman. Thank you, Stafford Thompson. Uh, thank you, Bugguy8869. Thank you, Knight6831. Um, thank you, Frank, uh, Frank Sardo. Thank you, Alistair Shaw. Thank you, Jennifer Burrow. Thank you, Bijon. Thank you, DG40. And thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Sta uh, thank you Sean. Dan Stafford for doing a wonderful admin job. Thank you, Carl and Gaspar. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I hope you've had a wonderful evening, and thank you very much for being here. It's been very kind of you to be here and chatting away, and I hope you've enjoyed the books. I did manage to get through them all. Thank you, Eric O'Connor. Thank you, uh, um, Not a Wolf. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dana Poker. And Lucy Rowe. Thank you. Thank you all. And ooh, take care. Bye. Thank you, Aaron Sharon. Thank you.